Welcome to Red Pill Raw Truth. I'm your host, Matthew Horbury. Today we are lucky to be joined by two guests. First, let me welcome back to the show Mr. Andrew Red Pill Johnson, author of the book 911 Finding the Truth. Welcome back, Andrew. Hi there, Matthew. How are you doing? I'm very good. I'm glad to have you back. Thanks. Uh, also, I'd like to. No. Also, we are highly honoured to welcome to the show the most controversial figure in the 9-11 truth. Often wrongly ridiculed, slammed, scorned, ambushed, even threatened when she should be honoured for the Nobel Prize. She's the author of the book, Where Did the Towers Go? That has been called the most important book since the Bible. Welcome to the show, Dr. Judy Wood. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, let me take issue with the statement, controversial. Okay. That that that, that uh, sets up a psyops. What I present is not controversial. Okay. Yeah, you know, fa facts are not controversial. Well, it might be controversial whether someone wants to look at the facts, but uh, you know, w when people say something's controversial, that inserts doubt. That's part of the uh, the, the psychological um, uh, operation. Okay, I never said your information was controversial. Right, but I'm controversial, but I'm I'm a human. I don't think that. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I apologize. But you, you see, you see how that habit gets picked up. You know, somebody says someone's controversial. Uh, I may be the most hated, but that's you know, I'm not I'm not it's not controversial if I'm a person. It's not controversial if I present uh, evidence. I think you're only, I think you're only hated until people have looked at your work, and then uh, I think uh, you yep. suddenly yeah you, you you win people over just by pure evidence. So, so why am I uh, referred to as controversial? Uh, I just, I just thought. Um, no, no, not by you, but it's it's a, a commonly used term. It is. I think it's a uh, part of the psyops and that. I was reading something about um, somebody sent me a message this week, and I was sort of diverting off a little bit from what we normally talk about. But it's uh, psycholinguistics. It's how language is used to create implicit uh, assumptions. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, uh, of the example that was given. Yeah, it's a phrase, uh, who rattled your cage? You know, when somebody says to you, who rattled your cage? That's, I don't know if it's su such a common phrase in the US, but it's, it's quite common in, in the UK, this, this phrase. And there's, you know, this is this idea of psycholinguistics, is when you hear that phrase used you know, quite regularly, it, it, it conjures up this impression that you, you know each person is in a cage, and uh, you know they're happy because when when this you know when you use this phrase "who rattled your cage," it's like somebody is reacting you know uh, in a way which is either ex extreme or it's inappropriate or whatever. And so, in just that those few simple words, you, you know you've encapsulated this idea of slavery and that we should be happy. With, with slavery by being and in also, the cage. And also doubt. Uh, yeah. Rattling your cage means that, oh, you, you, you little thing are, are upset. My, me who are accusing you of it, oh, I'm fine. You're the, you're the you right. know, little life who's upset. And I think, I think we, we, we each get uh, kind of used to using these phrases and that, that particular phrase, I must have said it probably, I don't know, at least a hundred times, you know, in my lifetime. And it's, you just kind of pick these things up, and who, who thinks of these phrases? Some, I mean, sometimes we know, and sometimes we don't. But uh, in, in 2007, uh, it, uh, a certain person held a, a conference that they invited me to. The conference yes. became entitled "9/11 in Truth: What's Controversial and What's Not." Like we're going to decide what's controversial and what's not. Meanwhile, somebody else is giving presentations, and their conference is entitled "Lifting the, the Veil." You know, enlightenment, and think of the yeah. different connotation that that gives. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, I, let's get I into the. Uh, sorry, Matthew, carry on. No, okay, I was going to say let's get into the uh, the evidence and let's uh, let's uh, explain what um, what happened on 9/11 because it's the most important thing. What happened? Oh, very yeah. much, very much. Uh, because if you understand what happened everything else falls into place but if you don't know what happened and, and there's um, you know I, I realized there's three main reasons that people don't understand what happened they don't know the, the truth and they have trouble getting there 
And that first thing is uh, that, that, you know, poor problem solving skills. They don't understand you need to begin with what happened, not theorizing, speculating, hypothesizing, and imagining. And the second thing is group think. People don't want to be out, you know, solo. And that's partly from, you know, an animal instinct. Think of a field of deer grazing. One spooks and they all run, and only one of them knows why they're running. Uh, and be, but they feel safer running with the herd. But it, once they're running with the herd, it's very easy for just one person to redirect that herd. And the third thing is they're terrified of the implications. They don't want that to be the truth, so they're, they, they're going to find all sorts of excuses. Well, that person's controversial who's, who's showing those facts, so we're going to ignore those facts. But whatever tree, they're, they're, they're trying to, um, they're uncomfortable with themselves looking at the facts so because they don't like where what it says. And so they're, you know, it's, it's a uh, subconscious kind of attempt to avoid that discomfort. But anyway, those three things, you know, and, and they don't get there. Right. I think you're right. I was, uh, uh, when I was lost, when I first discovered that 9-11 wasn't quite as it seemed, as the mainstream media explained it, I was looking for some, some leader, and I found my false leaders. And uh, mm. you get I, I, got, I got a question to ask you. Okay. Do you think those who planned 9-11, it was pretty serious planning, do you think they forgot to plan a cover-up? I didn't even think mind. about it, to be honest. Yeah, at the, at the time when I was looking for answers, I didn't think about the cover up. I just thought I'd found my answers. That's where, you know, you, you get led down the garden path why the people are like, oh, cherry picked the evidence to support their theory and they said, right, there we go. That's what yes. happened. And you go, oh, look at what's I, happened. And they've, they've put a nice slick documentary for you to watch that's mm -hmm. too well made. Yeah. Uh, this, there's a quote I read on the internet, and I'd forgotten where I, I found it, and I found it again. Uh, Mark Tikarski is the one who, who said it. He said, if you find yourself on the garden path, this time, it's a good time to leave the garden. Yeah, well... Yeah, you break from trails are left out there to, to be found. I, I call it uh, like an Easter egg hunt for a three-year-old. You know, the three-year-old, you know, the Easter eggs are right there out there in the middle of the path, and the three-year-old thinks they've really discovered something, they hang on to it and treasure it. And there's, so there's Easter eggs that are just laid out there like breadcrumbs that steer you off into the wild blue yonder. Yep. Too easy to find. It was too easy to find. Yep. Okay, so um, where we start with the evidence? Should we start with um, what happened to the towers? Well, that's an excellent place to start. That, that's another uh, problem with the problem solving skills. You need to start with what happened. A lot of people say this did it, this, that did it, that did it did what? What's it? You have to define what it is before you can say, you know, thermite did it, bombs did it, bin Laden did it. You know, what was it that got done? So once you de define what it is, then it becomes clear what the occasion is. It's kind of like you have a dead body. Does it have bullet holes in it? Does it have poison in it? You know, you do an autopsy to see what it was that got done that killed the person. And so uh, part of finding out what happened is determining the destructive mechanism. You know, were, were the, did the, did the uh, buildings get beaten to death? Did, did, you know, did a wrecking ball hit them? Did a missile hit them? Did, you know, different damage happens from fires burning up a building versus uh, something slamming into them. You know, slamming into them is kinetic energy, whether it's a missile, wrecking ball, big hammer, little hammer, hammer lots of little tiny hammers. That's you know, something slamming into something. And if, if it's a gravity collapse, that would be kinetic energy destroying the building. You know, one floor bashing into the next floor. And uh, another type of destructive mechanism would be thermal energy. We heat the building up till it melts or till it, you know, if it, it's on fire, or till it, the steel softens and it gets too weak, and then kinetic energy kicks in. And another type of destructive mechanism that most people don't think of, I call it directed energy. Energy is directed, it's instructed to do something differently than it normally does. Kind of a, a no touch em thing. You know, it's, it's like that over there is being directed. Think of your TV remote control. It directs the TV to change channels without touching the TV. It's not using thermal energy, it's not using kinetic energy. It's using a different, different kind of signal that the TV picks up on. 
So I call that directed energy. And if it's used as a weapon, that's a directed energy weapon. It's a very large category. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, uh, she says it was uh, ray beams from outer space uh, or laser beams from outer space. Well, the destructive mechanism that would be caused by laser beams would be thermal energy. And we can rule out thermal energy as a destructive mechanism if we look through all the evidence. And you don't, ev th this is uh, something, because this is my area of expertise, uh, I, you know, you let the evidence speak to you and tell it what happened. As an analogy, I say it's like teaching a cat to walk on a leash or getting a cat to walk on a leash. If you, you drag the cat or you want the cat to go here where you're trying to tell it to go, uh, it's not going to be very good for you or the cat. But if you let the cat go where it wants to go, then it'll walk on a leash. So if you're, you're looking to bring so, if you're looking to bring someone to justice, is it really important what happened? Because they obviously did it. Does it matter? Is it that important to get, get justice? Okay, you're going to bring somebody to justice. What, what, what are you going to charge them with? Well, the destruction of the World Trade Center. All the, okay, yeah. what did they do? That you're going to charge them with. You got to charge them with a crime. You got to figure out what the crime is you're going to charge them with. So it is important then. If, right, because uh, you, you can't take somebody to court based on, mm, you just look guilty. I just think you're guilty because it's, it's, I feel it in my gut that I just, you look suspicious, so we're going to charge you with something. You need to know what they did. It's, you know, it depends on what the crime is. And then you take them to court to prove that crime or to demonstrate that's what they did. Like, uh, you don't say, well, you killed so-and-so. Oh, no, I don't have an autopsy report. I don't have a weapon. I just know you did it. Uh, I think that's going to get tossed out. And, of course, we have the, um, you know, well-publicized Casey Anthony trial where the prosecution failed to solve the crime. They, they did not prove what happened to the child. How did the child die? Was it accidental poisoning? Was it drowning? Was it, you know, chloroform? What, you know, did they beat the kid to death? It, that was not determined. It could have been, you know, negligence. It could have been that they uh, gave the kid, you know, overdose of sleeping pills they didn't mean to, and that would be homicide versus, you know, deliberately planned to kill the kid. So it's homicide versus uh, first-degree murder with the death penalty. Those are different crimes. Or the person is completely innocent, you know, but it's such a wide range. If you haven't proved the crime, you can't charge somebody with it legally. Right. So if there's, no, if, there's no, if there's no evidence for thermite, you can't take someone to court and say, you destroyed the building with thermite. No, no, no. Remember, we have to start out with what happened. And, right. and okay. the part of that is the destructive mechanism. What is the destructive mechanism of thermite? Well, we, we discussed this last week with me and Andrew. We, uh, pretty yeah, much, I think we put thermite to bed last week. But it's worth going over again. Is it thermal energy? Yeah, it is, it is. Or kinetic energy. If they claim it's explosive, which I don't think it is, but uh, you know, whichever they're, com they're they sometimes oscillate between saying it's an explosive and saying it, you know, it, it puts out lots of heat. Well, the building wasn't burned up. It didn't melt, and it wasn't beaten to death. It didn't suffer. From, it didn't uh, fail from kinetic energy or from thermal energy. So, instead of picking out a specific item under the umbrella of kinetic energy or under the umbrella of thermal energy. You know, that's what thermite would be, is be one of those items. They haven't even determined that it's the destructive mechanism to say that's what did it. Okay, and, so uh, what evidence uh, have we got then? Well, I, I, there's also the um, uh, the, the issue of, of um, you know, because they, they claim they found something in the dust, you know, right. some of the ingredients of it. And in my book, I, I talk about this, and I said, well, the building was turned to dust. That is one thing we, we do know. Most of the building was turned to dust. I'm not saying 100%, but the, the majority of it was turned to dust. And so, therefore, the dust would be expected to contain all traces of all materials that were in the building. So if you could find traces of chocolate, sugar, and nano wheat, you know, flour, uh, in the dust, that wouldn't prove that, that chocolate chip cookies turned the buildings to dust. It wouldn't even prove that those ingredients had been combined as chocolate chip cookies in the building. Nor it proved they're even capable of turning the buildings to dust. And the same is true for thermite. Finding constituents of the building in the dust does not is not proof of what happened to the buildings. 
Okay. Um, we, I had a question actually on the Facebook asking you about other things that were found in the dust that um, apparently that you never address. Oh, it, it, yeah. It, it's just another funny thing people say. Don't address it, and it, you know, look at the table of contents. But yeah, like like what? <coughs> um, oh, it was um, it were all them idioms, them radiums, and um, oh, you know, a big lot. Right, right. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, it's there's this USGS dust study that I presented in that 2007 conference years ago. I also showed why it's. It's unreliable data, and you don't cherry pick from unreliable data for one thing, because then you you've got biased data samples. You don't know what you have. But so I'll, I'll get into what those ingredients are in a minute. But would would you believe that none of those samples were taken from uh, the WTC complex? The you know ground zero. They're taken from you know outskirts. They did collect some samples under where the big dust cloud went up. You know where you expect stuff to be falling out of the sky, you know, into the dust. But they didn't report the values for those samples. The only values they reported, you know, the samples they reported the values for were from you know over yonder, over yonder, the very outskirts. Not even any of the uh, streets where toasted cars were or, or bodies were, which is very interesting. So it was obviously a biased data collection. But let's look at some of those ingredients: barium. Barium is a oh, oh you know the the European Union has uh, lowered the limit of acceptable amounts of barium that can be in children's toys. Uh, it, it's in the in the environment naturally. Okay, barium is a silvery white metal which exists in nature only in ores containing mixture of elements. It combines with other chemicals such as sulfur and carbon and oxygen and form barium compounds. Uh, strontium. Strontium is a naturally occurring element found in rocks, soil, dust, coal, and oil. Naturally occurring strontium is not radioactive and is either referred to as stable strontium or strontium. Otherwise, it would be called radioactive strontium. So just plain strontium is not radioactive. Uh, thorium is a naturally occurring radioactive substance in the environment, thorium exists in combination with other minerals such as silica, and small amounts of thorium are present in all rocks, soil, water, plants, and animals. Uranium. Uranium is common, uh, naturally occurring, and radioactive substance. It is a normal part of rocks, soil, air, and water, and it occurs in nature in the form of minerals, but it's never as a metal. Lithium. Lithium is a salt and occurs in nature. Uh, chromium. This, this is the funniest one. I've heard him talk about chromium. You ever chrome bumpers on cars? <laughs> uh, it, when they make steel, steel is, is mainly iron, like 97, 98, 99% iron, with other doodads added in, like chromium, nickel, mm -hmm. or something else, because that enhances the uh, structural properties as well as the environmental resistance properties of it. So chromium is a naturally occurring element found in rocks, animals, plants, soil, and volcanic dust and gases. Chromium is present in the environment in several different forms. You know, a bunch of, in metal, uh, chromium, which is the chromium zero form, is used for making steel. And uh, chromium six and chromium three are used for chrome plating, like bumpers or dyes or pigments, leather tanning, and wood preservation. Uh, Tritium. Now, I have an extensive, extensive uh, section in my book about uh, the tritium levels. Now, for a nuke bomb, or many nuke bombs, big, little, in-between size, or mini micro nano nukes, uh, the level of tritium would be sky high, approximately 900,000 times or a million times background levels, at least, because that's what it is from leaky uh, nuclear power plants. You know, the water coming out of those, if they have a leak, you get those sky-high values of tritium, about a million times background levels. The relatively low levels of tritium, approximately 50 times background levels, um, are actually the fingerprint of something else that's consistent with free energy technology that Stephen Jones played a large part in covering up in 1989. Uh, now, 50 times background levels is high. 
it's definitely not just you know a, a sample error or you know just it's not a small amount. There's definitely an anomaly there. It's it's explaining something or showing something. It's indicative of something, but it's not indicative of nuclear fission. So, of all the things that we found in the dust, uh, tritium is actually worth a look at. Yes, and right. I do cover it in my book. Even though I've been accused of not covering it by people who who proudly say they have a copy of my book, but haven't read it, <laughs> because yeah. that's plausible deniability. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh, I didn't read that part. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I were using it as a doorstop. Yeah, I've got the book though. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, the towers came to dust. They didn't slam to the ground. They um, they didn't. Um, they didn't they, they burn didn't up and they didn't slam to That's the it. ground, but they mainly turned to dust in midair. And the, the three easiest ways to prove that, as or to demonstrate that to yourself, to, is that if they'd slam to the ground, you'd have a big pile of stuff left over. Right. You know, a big pile of rubble. That didn't happen. If they slammed right. to the ground, uh, you know, they're built in the bathtub out in the, in the Hudson River below the water table, about 70 feet, that's 7 times 10, 70 feet below the water table. And, uh, you know, the bathtub didn't, didn't get ruptured. I'm not saying it didn't get scratched up. It didn't get ruptured. If it had ruptured, it would have flooded all of the underground of lower Manhattan because all the subways are connected to the bathtub. And that didn't happen. And uh, if it slammed to the ground, uh, some seismic chart somewhere would have recorded something consistent with the building sl- that big slamming to the ground. Instead, the seismic charts were picking up things all afternoon of, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, rock quarry blasts and even a uh, uh, an earthquake in Alaska. There was a, a spike that happened with each of the demise of the Towers 1 and 2, not with Building 7, but with 1 and 2, that were way lower than what you expect, and they calculate uh, the magnitude of, of uh, an earthquake based on the surface wave. And that was the only thing that was, you know, out of, out of, uh, you know, calm. There was no detectable S or P wave. But both of those waves travel through the Earth. They travel differently, and they, so they arrive at the seismic station with lag time between them. The P arrives first, then the S wave, the pulse yep. and the shear wave. And based on that, the uh, difference in the arrival time, and they know what the substrate is underground, they can tell you about how far away the epicenter is. And if you have a lot of different seismic stations and you know that distance, you can pinpoint where the epicenter is of the earthquake. But with uh, when the with the demise of all of the buildings, and, you know, all of the events on 9-11, there was no detectable S-wave or P-wave at any of the recording stations. And then even some of the okay. recording stations didn't didn't uh, couldn't detect uh, even a surface wave. Right, so we've got three major p- key pieces of evidence. So shall we just look at them one by one? So no rubble. Um, in well, the no, cha- let, in very the little rubble. Very li- not no rubble. Yeah. Very little rubble. Okay, we've got um, uh, we've got have. the chat. If we've got the chat window, I can paste pictures into there so people in the group can actually see um, certain pictures. So I've just posted a picture into chat. I don't know if you're in the chat room now that you can see. Um, I've just posted the picture with the um, the ambulance. Okay, cool. Yeah. So anybody who's in the chat room now, they can, they should be able to click on a look at that. It's not open, you know, for some strange. Or, the, or you can send it to the WTC page because we can go up and down. That's only one page to load, and so we can go up and down that page. Yeah. Okay. DrJudyWood.com/slash/WTC, and in Figure Eight is the ambulance picture. And right. Yeah. If you click on those pictures, they'll open up in a new window as a, in a large picture. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, the ambulance is, you know, backed up in front of, you know, the front door of Tower One. I don't know how close to it. It was, you know, a little bit of a distance there. But you, you see the ambulance sitting there. It doesn't look clobbered. Maybe the door is a little bit ajar, but, but there's no clobber marks on it. No, no big piece of steel on it. And you see some some of the outer columns. Uh, a photographer referred to them as wheat checks, and I think that's a good term for the prefab units of three columns wide by three stories tall that they bolted together. They prefab uh, fabricated them at the uh, factory, and then they trucked them in and put them together. So you see some of those wheat checks sticking up, and you don't see them sticking up much above the building adjacent to it, which is Building Six, an eight-story okay. building. For everybody who's in the UK, wheat checks are shreddies, by the way. <laughs> just, just to clarify that. Okay. 
Yep. All okay. right. Okay, carry on. And, and so, uh, but you see, you know, the, the, the north wall on the left and the south wall on the right are the remains of it. Um, and, and if it's no taller than the eight story building, uh, where are the other, uh, and it was a 110 story building above ground, where are the other 102, um, stories of outer walls, much less all the, the guts of the building? You see a little tiny pile there, you know, something back in the middle. That's stairwell B where, uh, there were 14 people who survived there. You know, they, first they thought they were goners because they thought they were under 106 stories of, of rubble. And, cause, and it was all black. Well, it turns out the dust went up and blocked out the sun. But as soon as that dust cleared, they looked up and saw blue sky and then walked out on their own okay. steam. They were able to walk out under their own power. After having 106 stories above them go away, I'm not going to say collapse because that would be kinetic energy, you know, smashing them. They didn't get cooked to death, so the, it wasn't thermal energy heating up the building. Right. So we've got more pictures that we can show about the rubble, though. So you can. Do, that's just one picture. We can. There's more in the figure seven from that that figure same page. Seven. Yeah, I think this is one we me and Andrew looked at last week. It's the, the one where you are seeing uh, all the, the lather pouring out of Building 7 in the distance, but you don't see any uh, yeah. Tower 1 and 2. You know, earlier that day, you wouldn't be able to see Building 7 because you'd have a 110-story building in your, you know, blocking your field of view. Yeah. And it's, and it's not there. <laughs> but and this is like ground level because you can also look and see the pedestrian walkway, which is equal to the, the second story. And cars can drive so which, which, you, which is Building 7 in that image? And Figure 7? You see the building yeah. in the distance with all the, the the fumes pouring out of it. I won't call them smoke because you're then your brain okay. is going to be biased to thinking that that's that that fire is the cause. I'm just calling it generically fumes or lather. Okay, so you the know. one center of the picture, we can just see one side of it. Right, yeah, the south side of it. The building to the left of that that you can't see anything pouring out of. That's the Verizon yeah. building. Right. But the uh, okay. b building seven is a forty-seven story building. It's just got one wall of stuff pouring out of it. Yep. And how how how, how uh, tall is the Horizon building? Uh, I don't know, but it's it's not as tall as the um, as the forty-seven story um, WTC seven. Okay, I was trying to just measure up the uh, piles yep. of oh, debris. Pi picture, the uh, you know, figure figure ten is even better. That's a closer yeah, up view. You can see the eight-story building. It looks like it goes up maybe a third the way up that the big part of the Verizon building. Okay. But you can see it's just you know heavy. It's it's such heavy uh, whatever it is uh, particulate coming out of the building that I, I call it lather, like you know uh, shaving lather you spray out of a can that just comes out solid. It looks like you know it's one side, one side only at that point. Just the south face is pouring out of. An hour before Building 7's demise, it starts coming out of the east face. But at that point in time, it was coming out of, you know, from ground to roof, from side to side, the entire face, but not around the edges, not not the faces adjacent to it, which is mighty peculiar. Did the building, did Buildings 1 and 2 do this? Oh, that's, that's an assumption. We're looking at evidence. Yeah, no, it's saying, evidence wait, of building in one. Just uh, no, this, this is an, there's an evidence that this is what that what building seven is doing. Building seven is obviously still standing, and it's got this yeah. stuff pouring out of it. We can't, we yeah. haven't determined what happened to it yet. So, uh, we're just. No, I think I think Matthew was asking if there was a similar set of uh, sequence of events that went on with towers one and two. In other words, oh. were they producing this sort of display that building seven did? Uh, yes, yes, but it was a, in it, over a shorter amount of time, and it uh, like well, we'll get to those ones in a minute. Uh, where okay. you know, there's this piece of the steel falling, and they're they're trailing this lather kind of stuff. Okay, so we're just looking at the rubble now, then. Okay. Yeah, carry on with the rubble then. Sorry. Thanks, thanks. It's um, so what. Uh, what else would you like? You know, this was the lack of rubble that we were talking about, and I think yeah. that's definitely established with these these pictures. You can see that yeah. you know that uh, eight-story uh, north facade of of uh, Tower One, but you know, where's the rest of the building? And you're I think I've got actually. Uh, 
I've, I've put a picture in last week um, where it's like a, where you've drawn on the picture to sh- show you a comparison. Let me just post that into the chat window. And then, okay, um, you see the little little uh, pile of stuff there compared to the total height of the building. That's yeah, that's a big difference. Matthew, when that's the image. When Doctor Woods, Hello? when Doctor Woods is done proving 9/11, we need to get her. You need to get her on. The Boston bombing and Sandy Hook, because there's lots of evidence there. <laughs> I'll let you tell that, Doctor Julie Wood. Yeah, well, 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 one thing at a time. You know, that's that's uh, that's a very, very, very important thing to learn to have discipline of determining what happened here instead of oh, uh, here's one detail, here's one detail, blah, 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 and I'm just going to jump to this answer because I need an answer so, so I can move on. Because then you end up assuming the problem you're solving and that is a major major key for how to run a cover up because in order to figure out what happened and, and, and solve a crime you have to, you have to first establish what happened and after that uh step number 2 is you know how it happened but through solving what happened you can figure out how it happened and then from there you know who did it why they did it and, and whatever but these other things you can't solve the crime until you know what the crime was and and uh, onward. Now, if uh, you're going to run a cover-up, what you do is get people to assume what happened and go after who did it or or how it was done. It was done with bombs. It was done with thermite. It was done with airplanes. It was done with Bin Laden. You know, and if you're saying, you know, Bin Laden did it, and you haven't established what it is, in order to say Bin yeah. Laden did it, you're assuming what happened. So you're only solving an assumed problem you're solving an imaginary problem not a real problem that is a big key and that's why people argue back and forth round and round and round because they each have assumed a different problem but as until, long as you're solving until we've established, oh, sorry, until we've right, established it, exactly what happened there could be no prosecution of anybody even if you could prove who did it yes correct correct because if you're and also if you're busy solving an assumed problem or a theoretical problem you have a, you have a theory that you're working on you can never ever ever solve the real problem you have to let go of theories and look at what happened in order to determine what the crime was. And that is a very major cover up because you know how fast we were told, you know, Bin Laden did it or, or it was done with, it, and it was never an investigation. It was just like, here's the answer. And people like yep. a quick answer. Or here, and if you don't like that answer, if you don't like the lie behind door number one, oh, we'll show you the lie behind door number two or the lie behind door number three. Just keep you occupied looking at the answer. Here's another answer. Here's another answer. So you don't turn around on your own and look at the wide open field of evidence right behind you and solve the real problem. There is a lot of evidence for 9-11. Yes. There's enough evidence with, with these other things too. But, you know, if you start jumping, hopscotching on, on a whole lot of different things, you, you have nothing because you, you don't know what's what. And also right, because what, what are you going to charge the offenders with? Kids they didn't really kill? You're right. Charge him for using or, or, crisis or, or, actors but, but, for but, but see, that, the public. But see, you're making assumptions and then you know asking you know right. whatever. In other you words, well, to I totally get what Judy's saying. She's saying you got to first establish what happened before you can go after them. For and not what, assume. Yeah, yeah, not assume there were kids killed or there weren't killed, kids killed or whatever. The, you're making the assumptions of want to go get somebody, and that is a very big point there. If it's a very, very basic animal instinct. Think of dog fights or chicken chicken fights, uh, especially dog fights. How come they fight to the death? Because when when people are in revenge mode or animals are in revenge mode, they shut off logical thinking. So if you can get humans in revenge mode, you can put everything anything over on them. Plus, if they're traumatized, trauma-based mind control. So uh, what this hit me on 9/11. When fight I or flight. In, uh, not ju- no, it, it, this isn't uh, endangering your life. This is like revenge. I went into campus uh, after I, you know, saw what was going on at home. Came into campus and uh, these two faculty members there, uh, and they were they were saying, well, after the coal bombing and this and that, we, you know, they, they were believing the the Laden story. We gotta go take them out. We gotta take them all out. So mentally, That's on the day, they, on that day, on the day, uh, on that day, and they they just seen the buildings turn to dust and or believe they collapsed because that's what they're told. Um, and and so they already mentally in their hand had their pitchfork and need to go after the bad guy need to go after somebody need need revenge need to go get somebody and that is what uh shuts down logical thinking and people quit thinking and you can put anything over on them and that a slick well, tactic 
Think about that. Uh, yeah. If, 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 so, so okay, they don't like the Bin Laden story. We'll give them the, that George Bush did or, or Dick Cheney did it. It's the same thing. You just substitute one for the other, and they're still in revenge mode. You need to go get somebody, and they're not. Although thinking. I do think I do think Boston bombings and Sandy Hook and all the other things are quite interesting. They didn't change the world like 9/11 did. I think 9/11 is the biggest event of the century. So, um, the, I, you know, the other things that are distracting. If you start mixing things up and making judgment, yeah, you can't say what anything is until you uh, you solve it. But we do know that 9/11 was a pretty big deal, and we know that it it affected that the entire JFK. planet. That and JFK. Killing the president of the United States in open view like that is pretty oh, but, big, also. But but think about this this uh, this trauma. This 9/11 traumatized the whole world. They so saw this building coming apart in the dust, and like the sky was well, falling. President Kennedy's head exploding was a trauma for my mom. Right, but you, ha- but you but you had to me. have a, a TV set to see that. Or now you were there in Dealey Plaza, you know. Right. One of the other right. things I, I was going to say is that if you if you can encourage people to make assumptions, then whether that's done by putting things on the mainstream TV or, you know, um, phrasing things a certain way, whether you do that on mainstream TV or within the, you know, what might be called the alternative knowledge community or the conspiracy community, whatever name you want to give it, once you can get people to make assumptions, then you can get the cover up going. You can get the cover up going. The more that you can encourage people to make assumptions and the more that they don't realise they're doing it, the more effective the cover-up will be. Because I, I for example, uh, posted a short comment on Facebook just on this very topic. I assumed that the people who were giving out the thermite story for 9-11 were trustworthy. And it took me a long time because they assumed they were trustworthy because they were disagreeing openly with the official story. So I assumed that they were actually telling the truth. And it took me a long time, well, a fair amount of time to work out that wasn't the case. So in other words, I'd made an assumption, which I then had to do quite a lot of work to work out that that assumption wasn't true. And there was a certain amount of pride that I had to swallow within myself to say, yep, yeah, well, I was wrong, you know, I misjudged this, and I've got to relook at it again. I've got the evidence again, I'll go back, you know, tear up a few sheets of paper or whatever, yeah, Start Matthew. Again. Yeah, Andrew, I, I made the same mistake. Dr. Woods, right. I, so saw, I. So I, I saw you, Dr. Woods. I heard you on... Uh, Dr. Wood. I heard <laughs> you on... It's a, it's, a four, it's a four letter... My last name's a four letter word. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, heard, I heard you on uh, Dr. Wood, yeah. I heard you on Bob Tuscan's show about four years ago, three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was in the chat room watching 50 people tear you to shreds because it was controlled demolition and thermite and it, you did must you, also know, this is, you this must is really, I was there I point. was there not yeah, only did on. they tear you to shreds but they ripped Bob Tuscan apart and said he works for the Mossad and you're just controlled but, 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 opposition and you're yet, growing up yeah and I apologize no, for no, what I they would, did this, this, to I'm, you I'm you delighted know. to talk to you right now because I, this, uh, I no, well, I've they were wrong. You but everybody, everybody. No, there's something more. There's something yeah. more important. I want. I would like you to ask you. See, I've never talked with you before. I don't know what your answer is going to be, but I saw the chat room that day. I saw the people in the chat room were ticked off because he wasn't allowing callers. Do you remember that? No, he word. didn't. He wasn't yes. accepting callers, and and the people in the chat room were ticked off because of that. Right, and he also. Then it turned to like, okay, you are f- with Mossad because you know Bob's Jewish from a Jewish family, right? But and the, the, the poor the, guy is taking a, a ton of hits, right? right no, but, I mean but, he's a friend of mine. Know, I love him, you know. So right, then but, they started but, accusing okay. him of that. There was trolls everywhere, and they were painting you as you were just throwing this half baked theory up to lead us away from the truth. And I'm seeing now that. What you had is likely really truth, and the other stuff was was based on what it appeared to be. So I, I well, you well, know, people, people were conditioned. Rich. It's this uh, conditioning that goes on with people. But what I what I just got excited about is that you're you're somebody who can who can uh, uh, you know validate this that 
the people in the chat room were ticked off that they couldn't call in because they wanted to rip me to shreds. They wanted to call in, but he wasn't accepting callers that day. And then guess what? They connected somebody by Skype, and they called it a caller. Do you remember that, Fetzer? Jim Fetzer? Yeah, I know I Jim that Fetzer. Well. Yeah, that was connected We've by Skype. We've had him on many times. Dr. Jim Fetzer, Professor Fetzer. Yeah, yeah. That, he was right. connected by Skype, and then I was disconnected from the show. And they'd reconnect it, and they, they claimed I was I was too terrified or upset or whatever to answer. No, I was I wasn't connected through Skype. And then it was like you know I think three different disconnections, but uh, they had Fetzer connected through Skype, and they pretended it was a phone call. If we go okay. down, I'll be back. Because <laughs> they do that to us all the time. They did it to us. Oh. All just as we were going about to yeah. start the show. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, that was just an interesting event there. But uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was definitely a pre-planned event too, because you don't have somebody on Skype, uh, you know, spur of the moment. Rick, over the last two days, um, I've spent over 24 hours talking to Dr. Judy Wood, and um, she, some of the stuff she's told me on phone, you, you're going to be, it's, it's going to blow your mind when you hear about some of these people and what they've been up to. Um, Andrew Johnson's going to be a, a key. Key to revealing half of this. It's gonna honestly. It's um, oh. I think. I think to summarise what you're saying, Matthew. I I just uh, say to people, you know, what I'm going to tell you, me, me Andrew Johnson. What I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you now. But if I was to lay out the whole story, a conspiracy, even a conspiracy theorist wouldn't believe it. You know, it might sound like a very cliched way of saying it, but that's that's kind of how I expressed it. You know, badly or. Yeah, well, I, I was I was just pointing out that take, so, take the, the yeah. cover up is so huge, and that people don't realize they're participating yeah. in it. But what what I was taking the opportunity is to respond to this particular event because I've never had that opportunity. That you know this was not a uh, a caller calling in; it was a prearranged uh, Skype connection, and the people in the chat room were ticked off that they. It, yeah, it, I was wrong. Yeah, Tus right. Tusky wasn't accepting calls that day, but the people in the chat room were ticked off and wanted to call in, and, and you know. Well, but, you know what? See, you, you never you know who controlled opposition is in this game anymore. Right? Oh, but, we do, but, mate. We do. But but in the chat room, pe why were those people lathered up to attack me? There was something that prepared them with that mindset. You know, maybe it went back uh, six months or a year or whatever. But people are conditioned to attack me and, and you know string me limb to limb. You know, it, it's a uh, it's they were conditioned to that called Project Mockingbird, and what and they it wasn't are anything they are I people was saying. that are they are people who are trained to go from network to network, work with with fake hosts who are working for the CIA, FBI, or secret societies. And other they're there to discredit people. the real hosts out there. Yes, and but, yes. But we don't we don't need to uh, you know you know go beyond what we see. I just was relaying my own experience that, of that day. But uh, there's there's quite a few of these. But anyway, um, that you know instead of looking at the evidence, these people are conditioned to ch chase their tails around and and run with beliefs and opinions and whatever and, and beliefs that there's something with my character. There was another thing that came up in the past day or so that Andrew, I guess, shared with me this morning that um, uh, some folks are wanting more personal information about me, like they never know who you're dealing with. Well, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, what color underwear I'm wearing as to the evidence. The evidence is the evidence. It's independent of me. These aren't claims I'm making. I'm showing evidence. Evidence yeah, stands by I itself. I think the best thing to do is is to go through all the evidence so there's no doubt in anybody's mind what well, happened. So yes, they have to see it. They have to ev see it. Yeah, ev every single nuance of it. So if there's any video clips that help the evidence to get it in, in people's minds or um, any photographs, which we just present everything and then we can explain exactly I'm, about the court case. I'm a little kid who, who, who says, looky, looky, the, the, the emperor had not have any clothes on. Where everyone yes. else, you know, was afraid to say so. And I'm, I'm just pointing, you know, because I, I haven't been conditioned to, uh, to say, oh yeah, his clothes are lovely. I'm just saying, looky, looky. You know, I'm just pointing at, I think, look, it's I right I think also if I say, I may just say at this point, if, um, you know, obviously we're sort of, uh, diverging in different directions mm -hmm. a little bit. And if people do want to go and look at the evidence, then, uh, the, the, one of the newer presentations, uh, that to Dr. Wood did is the, so-called BEM presentation, 
which is actually at the top of the home page of drjudywood.com and it's I think 2 hours 22 minutes uh, mm. an auspicious amount of time and um, if you go if people you know get can't follow because we're obviously diversion directions and and, and Rick has got stuff to say and I've said stuff and Matthew said stuff so mm-hmm. it, can, it can get a little bit confusing so we, obviously you know uh, Matthew and Dr Judy will go through the uh, evidence as well here but if you look for the BEM 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 that's BEM presentation you can Google Breakthrough for that. Energy Movement yeah Breakthrough Energy Movement and you can always go back to that after we finish this and that you know I think that's that's a pretty good um, sort of compact sort of walk through I, isn't it yep I, I start out in that presentation saying uh, okay is the answer 27 or is it 19 or you know is, is am I right if I say the answer is 27 if I ask uh, who's who's the uh, Rick Rick is the answer 27 am I correct ask one more time I was saying something to Annie oh uh, if I tell you the, the, I tell you the answer is 27 am I correct well, ask the question again because I missed it. I was talking. Bingo! Again. Touchdown! You, you're a winner. You win. You win. See, you have to know what the question is before you know if the answer is correct. Oh, okay. You were tricking so, me. Right. So, so if you, if you right. say if if if, if uh, someone says it was thermite, it was it was nukes, it was this. What was it? You have to define right. the problem before you well, can solve it. Well, I was saying I was saying in the chat room when the show started. I said. I know exactly what she's saying because when I was a kid, I used to play that game Clue. So to win the game, you have to be able to say, Colonel Mustard did it with the candelabra in the study. You have Excellent. to have the, you have to have the crime scene, the weapon, and the person who did it. And, and how they did it. Right. Yep. Yes, and right. Yep. Bingo. So you know, if you say this is the answer, well, we don't know if it's right or wrong unless you know what the problem is. And actually in teaching, uh, engineering classes, the very first rigorous engineering classes, students learn that very thing. It's run kind of like boot camp. And it, once you get into the habit of first defining the problem, listing what you've been given, the information you've been given, and then draw a line across the page, write what you're looking for, what one answer you look for, draw another line across the page, and then start solving it and annotate it. Once you get into that habit, no matter how simple the problem is, it just solves itself. Otherwise, you, you know, you're going around in circles trying to figure out how to yeah. get the answer. Oh, I totally you, agree with you. In fact, one of my favorite documentaries that we play on the network, and he's going to be a guest, is from Trey Smith from a website called God in a Nutshell. And this guy will take something, like his latest movie is about Noah's Ark. And he goes back, looks at the Bible, looks at the evidence, and points out stuff that literally proves Noah's Ark where it is that it really happened about the time it happened and that there was a flood and you know I mean that doesn't necessarily prove God but to me it does because mm-hmm. I already know there is a God from spiritual stuff but it confirms it in other words he he went about making a documentary about showing that there is biblical history in the Bible and Noah's Ark is real and took three hours mm-hmm. to present the case and at the end of it your jaw drops he's done the same thing it, with the Nephilim you know you talk about the yeah exactly you talk about the game Clue and and I think that's great we need to bring that kind of education back to, to people because now they're, they're taught to as fast as you can answer the standardized multiple choice test and just if you can guess at the dots you know to color in it isn't a test and of knowledge. And the real answer is none solving. of the above, because nothing is what it appears to be these days. But uh, also, in it. doing this, in doing this, people lose the ability to solve problems. And in solving problems, you first have to define the problem before you can solve it. And yeah. they don't define the problem. No, uh, I think know, also, if I, if I can make an analogy, we call the game in the UK Cluedo, not Clue. But what what Doctor Wood essentially found out was that, you know, the way that Cluedo, Cluedo works, or the Clue game works, is you have a pack of cards, uh, one for the one for the person and one for the room, and then you take out um, one from each of those categories and you put it in a secret envelope and put that in the centre of the board so that you know, no one knows what it is. And then you have to deduce by going through all the other cards which of those three are in the envelope. So it's a process of elimination 
that you have to, you know, uh, deduce which is the right card. But essentially what uh, Dr. Wood had found was that the cards that were in that envelope came from a completely different pack, from a, you know, completely different <laughs> box game, which uh, you would never uh, have been able to find out unless you'd actually been through all the evidence and ruled out all of the normal cards, you know, which you knew wouldn't be in a normal set. And then you eventually worked out that the card right. must have come from a yeah. different set. It's like so if that, you're playing... That's, that's what we're dealing with in this. Yeah, you if know, you're sitting uh, at a table playing poker with people, and you're observant, and you can remember, and you're saying to yourself, wait a second, how can they have four aces when I already saw two of them go down? Somebody's mm -hmm. cheating. Or, or, or this, the other Somebody's thing about cheating, right? That, you like, know what like I'm magic saying? Tricks. Or like magic tricks. You get it's this whole thing about getting the the audience to assume the wrong problem. You can't lie to them because they, they'd catch up with you. So you get them to do the lying to themselves by assuming the wrong problem. And an example I've I've seen is uh, you know you, you cut the cards in, in half and uh, and then and then say uh, all right draw 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 this card and you hand it out to the person in the front row and they pull the card off the deck. Okay, and then you turn around and you say show it to the whole audience. Make sure I don't see it. Okay, now slip it back in the deck, some place where where I you'd be sure I won't see it. You know, slip it back in, and then the the magician then starts shuffling the cards and distract people with how he's shuffling the cards. And then he goes, "Oh, here it is, looky here!" And he pulls out you know the ace of spades. You, but people were assuming it was because he got people to focus on where he stuck it back in the deck. No, he already knew what card the guy in the first row was going to draw. He already arranged that. But he, you get people to to assume the problem is in how he, the card was stuck back in the deck. They forget to realize that card was already selected. Right, it was already I'll identified. What you mean. I've been, I've, I've trained myself as a magician since I was twelve. Right. So what she's saying is, what she's saying here is, um, a magician has a, an ability. He's got many, many, many methods of doing this. Of giving be careful a though with that card. magic stuff, Matthew. It opens up portholes. <laughs> right, Illusion is cool. Stay away from magic. Yeah. Okay. I'll conjure in. Um, I've been messing about with card tricks. I could blow your mind with a pack of cards. But um, what I mean is, um, if I wanted to give you the three of spades, but make it look like you had a free choice, so you, you can have any one of these 52 cards. Here, pick one. You've got three of spades. I don't need to know where you put that card in pack, because I can reveal that three of spades anywhere I want. I can reveal it inside my shoe, because I've got a duplicate three of spades sat there waiting for me. <laughs> I could reveal it on top of a mountain, 50 miles away. It don't matter. I've got um, this and, trick and, that and, people fall for all the time. Right. Uh, I'm going to reveal oh, something now. Yeah. I'm going to reveal a big oh, okay. trick. Right. This is this is the, when when we see a, a, on TV. I'm going to I'm going to destroy some magic right now. When we're on TV and we see a, a chosen card signed appear somewhere, impossible. This is how it's done. I will walk up to a, a spectator and say, right, we're going to film in a minute. Right. What, what I want you to do is I want you to pick a card and I want you to sign your name. Right. Let's just practice. Right. You pick a card now. Right. Then they pick a card and then I'm going to put it on face at deck. Right. And then they're going to say, they're going to say, right. Um, they're going to they're going to sign the card. I'm going to say, just sign it there. So I'm going to watch them sign their card. Right now, I've got their card signed. I'll say, oh, that's perfect, mate. I'll just rip that up because we're not going to need it. I'll switch the card without them knowing, and they look like I've just ripped their card up. I've now got their card signed. I'll then hand that off to an accomplice, one of my cameramen, or one of my people who are there helping me. Right, I'm now set up. Right, it's time to roll action. I'll walk up to them and say, right, pick a card. Right, they will pick the same card that they've just signed, because I'm going to make sure they do. And then I'm, they're going to sign the card like they did. And then I'm going to do anything I want to reveal that card, and that my accomplice is going to walk off, and maybe he's going to put it somewhere behind a window or something like this. Hello, card behind a window. Yeah. Right, so now uh, we've got a signed card behind a window. Um, and I'll then... Yeah, you could um, so you could switch the deck to at, so that every card they pick is a three of spades. <laughs> yeah, I could do, I could do that, but a magician's got the ability to just give you any card he wants anyway. But, but, you yeah, know, yeah, the, the point that. the point is that they were thinking that the trick was being pulled elsewhere, not uh, up front, not initially. That's right. And, in, and so and the trick uh, that I want to use as an example, really quick, right? Is they're assuming something else. Like I, yes. I'll take a cigarette. You and get in them front of people in a club, I'll take a cigarette out of a pack, and I'll pretend to be holding it in my my hand, so up in front of them. 
and I'll my, move my hand in my other hand in front of the hand and go one, two, three, and then open both of my hands, and the cigarette just disappeared. Now, no yep. one, people are like, how did you do that? And what they don't yep. realize is if you're standing behind me, you'll see that I wet the back of my thumb. The cigarette is hidden behind yep. my thumb. I didn't right. make the so, cigarette. So the, there's, very, there's various tricks in one, but the basic it's idea logical. is... It's logical, yeah. yeah the, the basic idea is you get the, the audience to assume the wrong problem. So they're solving an assumed, you know, an, an imaginary problem, yep. not the real problem. Right. And if... That's why you need to determine first what happened. What exactly is going on here before you jump what, to the what's answer? What's the magic trick? Yeah, see, it's because the, 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 quote, magician is not lying to you. You're lying to yourself, but, but, but the situation is set up to lead you to make the wrong assumption about what the problem was. Absolutely. Now, now getting back to, to this, did you put that uh, link in the chat room? Um, right, the, the link that yeah, I... Uh, I put a video. I put a. I put a link in the chat room. Uh, the last picture I posted into the chat room was um, going back to nine eleven. This is a YouTube tower, video. The, oh, I put no. I posted the. Um, the the, ta- the, the chat the window, Matthew. The, the the shared chat window. That, um, the the video I just gave you. The link to in the yeah in the. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, so, in Skype. Uh, yep. Yep. In Skype, I gave you the link. It's okay, I've got it. Okay. Yep. And that video is a slow motion video of building uh, one coming apart. See, if we say collapse, we're assuming the problem. Now, it came apart, you know, how it came, or it went away, or you know, use a different term. That's why I use, you know, Cheetos and and uh, uh, fuzzballs and that type of thing. It is ah, actually yes, much more scientific yes. because it it uh, blinds you from biases. You know, using a different language. So here, the building's coming apart, and we're looking at it. So if at the if you uh, look at the beginning of it, you'll see in slow motion, you'll see that the northwest corner of Tower One. You see that white edge of the the corner of the building, and pretty soon you'll notice uh, a long, you know, straight piece emerge. Uh, it's one central of the, in it. One central, of the steel of the film. Yeah, and uh, it it starts uh, appearing, and um, Let's see, it's, I'm, I'm at 25 seconds and here, here it is, 27, 28, 29. At 30 seconds, you definitely see it clearly, this, this straight piece of, of material. We're not going to assume if it's aluminum cladding or if it's steel or whatever it is, but we see it trailing dust. That's a lot of dust is trailing and you keep watching it. All right now I'm at, uh, about 45 seconds and you don't see it anymore. Are you telling me that dust caught up and passed that piece, the solid material? No, dust has much, much more surface area per mass and it's going to be much slower to fall. What that shows is that that piece completely turned to dust and there wasn't anything left of the of the chunk. Yeah. And you can you can focus on any piece of this building. And then, then you start realizing that everything else is doing it too. That one's just easy to direct people to but you start yeah. looking at all the other stuff and you realize everything's you know kind of turning to dust as it falls. And it doesn't really reach reach the base. Now back on that uh, aha page, um, and there's some uh, not slow motion but fast versions of that. And you can see you know things uh, turning dust as they come down. But if you look at Figure Three or Figure Four, Figure Three is a good one. I call that the Twilight Zone. And uh, you might want to Figure Three. Uh, yeah, I'm doing I can, I'll, I'll, I'll copy it in. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, there's that, that's link just to make sure we look at the same one. I call this a twilight zone, because these people, when the building was coming apart, ran for cover. Now they just come out of their hiding places, and they, you know, they look like, their body language make, look like they, they think they just walked into the twilight zone. And actually they did. That's the intersection where that piece was falling towards. And they come out of their hiding places, like, where's the building? You see, you know, holding clouds up there, and you see blue sky. It's, you know, and there's a guy there with his arms folded, just kind of looking. And another guy closer up to the, that's building six in the foreground, with his hands on his hips. And, and I'll bet you their jaws hanging open. They're like, what the heck just happened? Where did the building go? You see some aluminum cladding. The building was a steel structure with aluminum uh, cladding covering the outer steel columns. And you see those, you know, pieces of aluminum cladding around there on the ground, just a few. Now there are some some steel wheat checks further down, 
but not nearly enough, not 110 stories worth. So you, you look at the guy you know close to us, not the Mr. Branford there, but uh, the, the the one with the backpack and the white shirt. He's got his hands at the side. It's like, yep. huh? And then there's another one trying to make a cell phone call. and you know, But you don't see fire, but you see a lot of unburned paper. Uh, it, one of the things that we heard people repeat over and over again, yeah, the military has, you know, has top grade thermite, special nanothermite. Well, you know what the military uses thermite for? One of the things they use it for, other than to melt gun barrels, they use it to burn paper. You know, if they have top secret documents and here the enemy is coming to take over their camp, they don't want their enemy getting that top secret document. So they have a grenade of thermite that poof, just burns everything up because it burns so fast. Uh, this paper isn't burned. Yep, and it's papers everywhere. And there's there there's isn't there isn't anything uh, any um, thermite or nukes that would leave paper alone. And uh, it, you know it, immediately uh, the the media you know like on that day and, and into the next day were reporting what they saw. That was before, you know, they, it, it, it isn't that somebody tells somebody and orders somebody to do something. It's that various suggestions, like, like the, the people in that chat room, uh, Bob Tuscan show, something had directed them to, you know, dish out all this anger and, and attack me. It wasn't something I said. So it's something that can condition them. So, you know, that kicks in a couple of days after the event of 9-11. Uh, where, you know, people are somehow directed because of hearsay, of the, you know, like, oh, Bin Laden, you know, and so people, oh, yeah, we got to go get some, you know, they, they're not thinking clearly anymore. But the very first reports are generally the best somebody can do at that moment. And um, I'm going to uh, play the audio for uh, for this one's one of my favorite ones here. Um, George Stephanopoulos at the scene with Peter Jennings in the studio. This is almost, or just a little over 24 hours later. This is 12.44 p.m. on 9.12. And let's see. A little earlier, uh, we raised this question, which was actually raised by ABC's Jackie Judd, as we look at these areas down below, and the video where the towers used to stand, and where is all the rubble gone? And have you, have you been able to And Is there any way you can answer that question? I'm sorry, Peter, I didn't get the question. Okay, I apologize. Jackie Judd and several other people keep asking us, when you look at where the towers used to stand, there is surprisingly so little rubble. Where did all the rubble well, go? It's a very good question, Peter, and I have asked some people who've been doing some of the rescue and recovery work this morning. If you look behind me, you can see the very remains, the skeletal remains of the World Trade Center. And one volunteer, Robert Gerlinski, explained to me the reason there's so little rubble is that all of it simply fell down into the ground and was pulverized, evaporated. No, no, go ahead and stop it there. Uh, and here's George Stephanopoulos. He's at the scene. He's a reporter. He's supposed to be telling the world what's happening there. And that's the best he can do. He's not trying to make a fool of himself. You have to feel for him. That's the best he can do. He kept apparently asking people until this volunteer gave this line. And, okay, once somebody's given an answer, they... No, no, you know, no, 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 no. George Stephanopoulos worked for Bill Clinton. He's a card-carrying Illuminati witch. Uh, it, that's That's an assumption. Yeah. Now, this that would be contrary to covering this up. He's he's pointing out that there's no little rubble in the building evaporated, vaporized, or whatever he's, you know. This is before people I are I get doing, your point. Yeah, I'm just saying yeah, he wouldn't yeah. have been a high-level advisor to Clinton if he wasn't in on it. He was, no, I, I think very few people are in on it. You know, and so that you have that's an organic reaction. That's the point. He, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, um, if they, 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 they wouldn't use the cover-up story that the building evaporated, it's not a good enough cover-up story. It's, it's, it's not, if, it, if he'd have been fed a line, that wouldn't have been the line he'd been fed. You know, if he's a, I, I, I mean, I, I, I struggle with media. I, I, I'm really having a bad time with media, um, where my head is on media is. But this, he, he's got to be on the scene. And he's saying the building evaporated. It's ridiculous. That's a line that couldn't have fed it fed anybody. Who he he, he to would just totally discredit himself if anyone really listened to that. The building fell down, the ground was pulverized and evaporated. The people that, who are in charge know. can do better than that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, but but it's not going to be believable. Sometimes if it's the people in charge will tell you the truth, bigger and you'll never believe that. So let's just tell them. Let's make this. No, no, that's, an assum- so that's an assumption. That's an assumption yeah. you're making. Here, let's look back. What is the evidence we're seeing? We're seeing that there's not enough debris there. And here's someone who actually agreed with that. But by the end of the All week, we're, they're talking about piles. Many, many, yeah, many times we're talking about, but, but they'll but put out the truth first, but they'll put it out in a way that's unbelievable, uh, like they, Sandy they, Hook is, of Boston. No, they don't, so they, even if you they, figure it out, you look like you're nuts is what I'm no, saying. No, no, no. They, they, this gets forgotten real quickly. That's what they're banking on. But what at, initially, because you can't have everybody in the world in on it, you need an organic response that seems... Like you know, and, and there's evidence that this these responses we saw in in the various uh, media are just traumatized by it. They don't know, you know, this building collapsed, that building collapsed. Well, oh, the next building's going to collapse, and they they panic because they really don't know what's going on. And think about it, you have this this top secret, uh, the biggest psyops on the planet that we ever known of. Huge psyops. Are you going to just like you know leak it out? It's the worst psyop. It's the biggest. Right. When so you get you when you get to end of, when you Rick when you get just, to the end of this you go, you're going to be blocked honestly. Well, let when me you, just when you finally well, get, let I me mean, clarify. Just, just, just that you've seen nothing right. yet. Yeah, I just want to clarify what I'm taught the the trick that is used sometimes. If you put out a truth, but you do it in such a way. Like uh okay like I, I understand like but this this was this was not ever played again we didn't hear we started hearing about pile rubble pile somebody's working on the pile the hot heat on the pile we started yeah. hearing that later on and that shaped everyone right we well, didn't like, hear like this we didn't hear that there, there's not enough rubble well here's Rick, the ex- you know, example you know you of that the, the assumption of the explosions there's a video yes. clip we're going to play later that you, oh, it's going to blow yeah. your mind oh okay. I'm excited okay. about it but I just wanted Honestly. you know the listeners okay. to understand just in, in a quick example, uh, Paul McCartney was killed or died in '66. Okay. Yeah. Now yeah, yeah. you want to you want to discredit that. So what you do uh, no. is yeah, you tell we're, we're, some we're, truth. We're, we're going to talk about 9/11 and yeah. what we can see. Yeah, but I'm giving an example by putting out the real story in a conspiratorial way that so if people try to repeat it, they sound like they're nuts. Uh, in other words, there was a movie that came out a couple years ago that was supposedly a tape done by George Harrison on his deathbed. Okay, well, if the guy who did that isn't really George Harrison's voice, and they put that out to the public, when it leaks out that that wasn't really George Harrison's yeah. voice, then everybody yeah. goes, okay, the whole thing is a myth. When in fact, the whole thing is not a myth, uh, but that uh, must it, have been. It, it, let's Rick, let's get back to 9/11 and yeah. talk about uh, what happened on 9/11. Did you see enough yes. debris there? You know, you saw George Stephanopoulos talking there. Look behind him. W- where's the building? Is there a big pile there? You know, by the end of the week, we're t- we we're being told about this big rubble pile, humongous rubble pile. But you look and you, you know, right after the event, where's the rubble? Every single bit of evidence is consistent with that. And and okay, then we hear the story about the uh, oh, lots of heat, lots of heat. See, this the, it picks up after it because they they need kind of an organic start, but then it just at a drop of a, a hint, uh, people innocent people pick up that hint and run with it. And one of those uh, hints was the you know by these uh, FEMA gals who said hot steel toed boots they were melting on the pile because it was so hot. Uh, and let's I've got to, that sound to play. Let's see if I can make that go. Whoops, uh, I had my uh, the things muted. All right, I'll start again. It's on the video page. It's the women go in and out of ground zero up to ten times a night, often until two in the morning, delivering whatever it is rescue workers need to do their jobs, like the ones working in the hot spots. Steel-toed boots is one of the biggest things. Um, steel-toed boots. Steel-toed boots. Out, still on the rubble. It's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours, um, and they're burning their feet. Now, let's think, you know, think logically about this. If my steel oven is melting, the turkey inside is more than well done. Yet there are no reports of burned feet. 
And if the if the rubble pile is that hot, where it's actually a debris field, if it's that hot, it's like you'd be burning your steak on a grill at that temperature. So just listening to this, you know, they sound like lunatics, but I'm not blaming them. They're not they're not physicists. They're just repeating something that somebody told them. And then it gets repeated over and over again by people who should know better. You know, real physicists that should know better. Or then they were in on it. Or they were told yeah. this is what you say, like the actors no, outside. You know, no, they, they, uh, I think it works much better if they believe it. If they believe it. So what, what it is it, whoever says a statement like that, those are the videos that get put forward. But they, they emerge naturally. But anyway, here's Rudy Giuliani. You know, okay, let's say we hate him because he has lots of money or whatever reason. But does he really want to make a fool of himself? And listen to, to what he says here. Um, whoops. Again, this is uh, the sound effects. Yeah, how does he know what the temperature is on the rubble pile? He's talking to There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. I could be standing here, and you could be standing there. And I could be describing to you, Governor, the, the, the site. And then a fire would break out in between us. And uh, it was just by luck or the design of God that we weren't killed. Now, uh, is he standing on 2,000 degree, uh, you know, barbecue grill? But, but what you can get from this is he's describing something weird. It, apparent fires that just burst out. In order to, for an apparent fire to burst out, if it's, it's truly a fire, it has to be that temperature. But it can't be that temperature because he's standing on it. <laughs> like this, the paper's not burning. So all these stories about hot molten metal flowing like rivers. Well, it, we know it's not hot. Whatever it is, it's not hot. We can say something is glowing, something is flowing. Or something that looks like fire, but Rudy Giuliani didn't get burned up and he was standing on a grill that was 2,000 degrees, you know, a barbecue grill. That's what I'm talking about, being able to not make assumptions of the evidence. Right. Uh, can we go, let's go back to the towers, because you said they, they, they didn't slump to the ground, they didn't... Uh, um, they weren't blown up. They didn't up. burn up. They didn't burn up. It, it, they were the turned to dust. Is, and we, 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 so we found we found that there's no evidence of a rubble pile. What other the evidence was that they didn't slant to ground? Let's just I want to really, really let everybody know that the, they did the size, turn to dust. Get it? Yeah. Well, you could yeah. you could look at it. we saw we saw some of it turning to dust right there. And yep, also, we if, we, if we look on the uh, hot page and you look down that, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, it. If you start down that page from the top, yeah, there's some little guys waving their arms, and you see between them it says index. You can yeah. see that all the way down the page in each section. So that, but you don't see the guys waving. I'm just that's direct you here. So if you click on that, you, you're at this index of shortcuts. If you go to item H and click on the blue button, item H, dustification, and click there, you right. you see uh, you know a whole lot of stuff turning to dust. Now look at figure 45. And I call it shaving cream or Alka Seltzer. That's right, a, a chunk of. Week. What? I said, as I said, we didn't look at this picture last week. Okay, okay. You, you see, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's opaque dust trailing this steel, uh, wheat checks, uh, you know, unit fall as it's, as it's falling down. Now, is that from dirty windowsill? You know, somebody didn't dust this week or last month or dust for a year? That's a lot of dust. It's opaque. And I, I like people to just mentally think about this. Okay, let's say you're going to impersonate that steel, steel uh, wheat checks. You stand on the top of the towers, you cover yourself with dust, you jump off. The person on the ground looks up. Are they going to see that much dust coming off of you? Nope. Okay, so you grab a bunch of you know, armloads of bags of flour and you heave the flour out as you're falling. Nope, still you can't put out that much dust. Pretty soon you realize that steel wheat checks has to be generating that dust. It's turning to dust as it, as it goes down. And then if you look at, at figure 47, the same thing. It's a tremendous amount of dust trailing down. And pretty soon you look at, you know, the bubbler picture, I call it fig- figure 42. The whole building is just frothing up into dust. Now, and, and you, if you see a piece of, uh, you know, material flying through the air turning to dust, as we saw in that slow motion thing, or in figure uh, 49, you know, often uh, it's said by the uh, detractors that, oh, that's dust that settled on it. And then it, it because the dust is so fine, it hung in the air when when the steel columns fell over. Well, here, Which it, you know, is what? figure 49. It's a 49. series of, of images. Yep. And these, these columns are about 700 feet tall. 
these are part of the core columns and the building peels away like peeling a banana and the building goes away and then you know a few seconds later uh, this thing you know leaves a silhouette of dust behind it starts to fall and it turns into in dust and so you know my detractors say oh well uh, that that was the dust that settled on it well first of all how is dust going to settle on it in uh, 0.00001 seconds and how is it going to settle on vertical columns and that first image you know figure A of the uh, 49A you don't see any haze of dust around it and then they say the dust is so fine it hangs in the air well how does it settle on it if it's so fine it hangs in the air you can't have it both ways no so that is, it, visual, that is visual and there's five images there that just take you from a solid steel down to a dust and the fact that this is unsupported sticking way up there says that that steel is strong and robust in order to stand by itself and support itself for you know a few seconds but then it just is turning to dust and in uh, figure 48 you see um, uh, that's a C- the CNN I think Aaron Brown is the it, 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 you know, it's the good lord video I call it. it he says good lord you know when he plays it um, you can see that it, it, it's like the steel column just kind of faints into dust there's a whole lot of different views you know people say it falls over well if it fell over to the far direction if you look at a, a video 45 I mean 90 degrees to that you should be able to see it tipping over you don't see it tipping over how about, you know, 180 degrees from that? You don't see it tipping over. 270 degrees from that, you don't see it tipping over. There's, there's Im- video of it all around. It doesn't tip over. Plus, you'd see, uh, you know, 700 feet tall, if it fell onto an adjacent building, it, it would, it'd take out, you know, a couple blo- city blocks. It would slice them, the buildings. Didn't happen. You don't see it down in the rubble field. And what I think that is, uh, is uh, the top of Stairwell B, the top of that area where the 14 people survived, below that. Well, so will be. Yep. yep. That's, that's, uh, you know, you can look and see it's, it, it looks like, in some of the uh, higher, um, uh, definition what videos that have been released since then, you can see I call them little stringies, little, uh, wires and stuff hanging out of, the, you know, the, if you get close enough to the that tall column, you know little crisp wires sticking out or rebar or something. It's you know, and uh, and then you can notice it. It looks like it's the stairwell in there, that region. Right. Um, so, so that's that's uh, dustification. So it, it's not pulverization. Pulverization is something banging against something. That's kinetic energy that causes pulverization. Like somebody getting a hammer and sm- smashing something against a rock. That's kinetic energy. Um, if you cook something until it becomes a gas, that's vaporization. Neither one of those things apply. We see a building right. turn to dust. Instead of using... Not evaporation either. Right, because that's that's like vaporization. It's uh, so we need a different term. And instead of using the inappropriate term, because then you're going to assume heat caused. It's kind of like calling the haze, calling it smoke. You're going to assume fire is the cause rather than something turning to dust. So I use this new word, and it's very easy to use because it, it's obvious what it means: dustification. The definition of it is whatever it was that was happening there. Yeah, the the it, instead of being a solid unit, it turned into dust as it fell. Dustified. Yep, dustified. It needs to be added to the dictionary because we haven't seen this before. It's a new phenomenon, so it needs a new word to describe it. Yep. So it's no, notable, and, and you can visually see it turns to dust. Yep, and and a lot of folks, uh, you know, to to try to. You know, answer the the detractors. Say, oh, she's using, you know, idiot terms. Or, oh, she's trying to dumb it down for you. No, that is not the case. This is the most scientific way of describing. It. You can call it characteristic two nine seven dash three a. That's hard to remember. I, instead, I call it dustification. That word isn't in the dictionary, so it can't be confused with anything else. And I think it, we know the meaning of it from the from the root of the word dust. So dustification is, you know. A good placeholder in case we do find something uh, that's already been defined, but it's it's whatever it is that's going on here. We're calling it justification, and I don't think right. we've seen that before. No, 
No. And but but that is an, a very important lesson. It's instead of making an assumed problem, we're not going to solve an assumed problem, an imaginary problem. We're going to solve the real thing. So we're just going to call it this term for convenience. So we don't. So we can break the habit of calling it something that's inappropriate, like like uh, uh, pulverization or vaporization or evaporation. Because you, you know, if we don't know that that's what the correct term is, or, or aerosolization, that's a specific process. We don't know that's what the process is, but we can be correct, absolutely scientifically correct, if we call it dustification, as long as we define that term. Right. So, shall we look at the bathtub then? Because that yeah. didn't break either. Yeah, well, the, the section right below there is, is lather. That's just my term for the opaque dustification. And like what Building 7 was doing all afternoon, you had this opaque, you know, wall of stuff coming out of it. I call that lather. You know, it's just, it's just opaque. It's not, it's not wispy. And you, somebody, I don't know if you asked or somebody else asked about uh, Tower 1 and 2 did the same kind of thing. Figure 50. Yeah, yeah, figure 50 shows Tower 1 lathering up. One face. But it just did it for very briefly. Yeah, I used to like Figure 50. Figure 50. Figure 50. Ah. You see, that's, that's the North Tower. And you can tell it's the North Tower because it's got that radio, uh, TV antenna poking up out of the middle. That yeah. identifies. That's, that's not an image you don't often see. You don't often see many truth oh, people. Oh, why don't they? Yeah. Guess why? <laughs> you can't that's say that's fire. Image. No, you can't. You know, well, it's, 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 if there were fires on a few floors, it's not going to do that on the entire side of the building. Right. Yeah, sure. We have this, so, some process that's black, some process that's, that's you know the lighter color. Uh, fine. We don't need to define what those are if we don't know. Just you have the you know lighter uh, dustification and darker dustification. Because that describes right. what we see in the picture. And that was right after Tower 2 went poof, and the dust cloud was kind of rolling out. And folks could say, well, that was the dust cloud from, from uh, Tower 2. Well, Tower 2 is only a few feet away. How did it get uh, uniformly up the side of Tower 1 to cover One the side. whole face? That means that, tower, that that's proof that Tower 2 had to turn to dust <laughs> in order to have done that, if that's what somebody's going to state. Yeah. So, you know, not knowing exactly what's going on here, you can, you know, either it's emanating from Tower 1 or it rolled up the side. But if it rolled up the side, that dark stuff at the top would be punched up further. Yeah. If you had a big updraft. So it, but it, but you, it captures you, 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 something you, 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 happening. Building 7 doesn't support that because Building 7's got nothing lathering up against it. It's just, it's on its own and it's doing exactly the same thing here. So you could yeah, say, oh, it's Building 2 fell down and it lathered up against the side of Building 1, but then what and fell it, down and lathered up against the Building 7? 7 started Not lathering up before Tower 1 went poof. So if someone wants to say it's, it's a debris from Tower 1, look at Figure 51. I call it the shower scene. They're lathering up together. <laughs> yeah, building 7 and Tower 1. Okay, yep. That was when uh, uh, Building 7 started lathering up. And uh, maybe it's a good time to mention it. It wasn't two buildings, just two buildings that were destroyed that day. It wasn't just three buildings that were destroyed that day. It wasn't just four buildings that were destroyed that day. It wasn't just five. It wasn't just six. All seven buildings with the WTC prefix were destroyed that day, four of which were towers. And I define a tower as something taller than it is wide. So there are four towers not three, there are four towers. There's a 22-story building three, which is this little skinny thing, bent building that was real, that was between uh, tower one and two and parallel to the bathtub wall. But we look at that later, but it was seven buildings. Seven. Okay, what, what, uh, would you like to talk about next? See, at the top of each section, there's a little, you, little tiny link that says index. I'll take yeah, it back up to the well, index. I, I asked you what uh, evidence there was that suggested that the buildings didn't slam to the ground, and you gave me three examples. And um, bath, you said breaking the bathtub, but one of them we haven't even done that yet. So, um, okay, yeah, I really let's want go to, to let's, let's go to G uh, bathroom. Now, I don't have a seismic chart in this one, but there's there's ones elsewhere. I think you you played some already last week. But go to uh, okay. you know, you jump you can jump up to the top by hitting the little link at the top of each section, and then click yeah. on the button next to G. And we're going to talk about seismic impact. Okay. Um, and we have this, uh, you know, this bathtub wall. It's, you think of it as, as really a, a dike. 
and uh, they brought it, you know, trucked in dirt and filled it in. Now, what you see in figure 35, some some of the figures have duplicate numbers. I haven't changed it because I refer to them, and I don't want the, to get out of sync with the recording. Um, but um, what you see in the in the distance is World Financial Center buildings, two and three, that were right across the street from uh, building um, uh, from Tower One. And you're looking at the footprint of Tower One. See that kind of uh, puddle on top of some shiny concrete there? Or what looks like shiny yep. concrete? That's the very bottom of the bathtub, right at the very base of all of Tower One. Now look there's in the no distance. Ground, there's, no, there's no underground there of Tower One. There's, there's, nothing further, there's nothing further down. We're at the very bottom. Now look in the right. distance on the right, and you see, uh, you can count down seven stories. That Those are the parking garages below Tower Six, or Building Six. To the right hand side. Yeah, see that you have the you have the yellow level, the oh, pink level, the yeah. blue level. Yeah, you know, so you yeah, know yeah, where yeah, your car yeah. was parked. Hmm. So you know where your car was parked. Yep. And they didn't want to take that down too soon because it's it's supporting uh, the bathtub wall. That's the original bathtub wall. If you click on that picture, you should get a you know a big picture should open up, or you can paste yeah. that link directly in. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give it to. Uh, you guys here. I've already pasted it into the chat room, I think. Oh, okay. Okay, and, and look at the, the walls. That's not repaired. That's rust from years that's on that wall. This is the outer wall. The Hudson's on the other side. And it was, there's actually another wall they built, uh, further down because they wanted to build right. the financial center there later. But when they were building the towers, the Hudson was right on the other side of that wall. Right. And that, and this is not ruptured. This is not repaired. This is just as it was. You know, yeah, it's, it's got scratches on it and dings in it and whatnot. It's got, you know, problems happen elsewhere, but it kept the Hudson out. It didn't, it didn't crash in. And here it's unsupported, which is even more dangerous. But where the parking garage is, it does support that. Now, you have the PATH train. That's the, the, um, Port Authority Trans Hudson. So it's like a subway that goes under the Hudson River from the New Jersey side up into the bathtub. Turns around, goes back out. What you're looking at in this bathtub picture, right where those, the parking garage is, see where those holes are? Just below those yep. holes and in the parking garage. That's where the subway goes out. And those are access ports to do something to the, the tunnel for the subway. But would you believe that the tunnel didn't get uh, destroyed? It, they they were worried about it because um, they had water down there, but with all the open, you know, uh, underground of the World Trade Center with all the fire hoses on it, had, water had drained somewhere. Once they pumped it out, it stayed dry. It did not rupture. The tunnel, the, and that was built in the early 1900s, like 1909, I think is when the, the, um, path train station, you know, the first, first started, uh, sending, so it was built like, you know, 1905, 6, 7, somewhere in there. They built stuff pretty well back then. You can have, uh, you know, a building going bam down on top and it doesn't, you know, you take this this hose kind of running under the the Hudson River. You shake it. You know, it's going to wiggle. It's going to you know crack. So if there had been bombs, we'd have broke that wall. Bingo. Yeah. So the, not, when you hear the, is it is it William Rodriguez that claims he can hear bombs in the basement? Yeah. Well, we're not going to go <laughs> into talking about what somebody else thought they heard or whatever. We're looking at what we yeah. can observe. What we can observe ourselves. Yeah. We're not, yeah, depending on what I'm just going to say people. that if we if we're using that as a witness evidence, what he heard want bombs because if he had heard well, bombs, we'd have we'd, we'd, broke we're the wall. We talk about what we see. Okay, on on figure okay. thirty six, that's uh, in February twenty second, two thousand two, when they were you know cleaning out the bathtub there. Uh, they got one of the path trains. The path train was parked under where Tower One had been, and and, and that's a whole uh, path train. It didn't get squashed. So when people talk about all the rubble getting stuffed into the basement, it didn't happen. Because the, the parking garage would have been crushed. That, that path train would have been crushed. And so, you know, also if, uh, this building had, had slammed to the ground, uh, you'd expect to see, you know, a pretty big size earthquake. Looking at the mass and the potential energy and then comparing it to the Seattle Kingdom. Because there's a lot of, of, um, seismic uh, data for the Seattle Kingdom that they took down with controlled demolition because it's near some fault lines and they were really worried about you know major catastrophes could get get unzipped so they were monitoring all of the area with lots of different si- mobile seismic units 
so that's why I picked the Seattle Kingdom because the evidence is, is so available. Uh, that had an S wave and a P wave, and it made a 2.3 equivalent on the Richter scale. Well, Tower 1 made a 2.3, and then uh, Tower 2 made a 2.1, less, but it's 30 times, that's 3 times 10 times the potential energy. It's a much bigger building that would go slamming to the ground. D- it didn't happen. You know, it actually, if you turned everything of Tower 1, we're going to compare Tower 1, it's, it's even more dramatic for Tower 2, but let's say from the 20th floor on up to the 110th floor, you turned Tower 1 to dust. And you just had, you know, a 20 story building left. That's not even extra robust, but just, you know, 20 divided by 110, that proportion, you know, just as though the weight was evenly distributed, but it's more heavy at the bottom. But we'll say it's evenly distributed. If you just have that 20 story building left at that footprint and drop it to the ground, I would expect it to make like a 2.3 on the Richter scale. So what about the other, uh, 90 stories? Not only that, the stab wounds across the street in adjacent buildings, you don't see anything, any stab wounds, but really much above the uh, 18th floor. Yeah, so that's pretty much conclusive, really. You see a big dome across the the street from Tower 1, and it's not clobbered, it's not dinged up, it's not dented, you know, it didn't have any landing on it. It's just the bottom part of the building that, you know, came apart and that, you know, that's about the amount of material you have there. Can I just interject something, Matthew? Uh, sure. Anytime you want. Earlier on. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll put a link in the chat window in a minute because it refers to William Rodriguez and some statements he made when he was on uh, Simon Mayo's uh, Radio 5 Live program. Um, just, just to sort of put a tiny bit of context before, you know, you can carry on with Dr. Wood. Um, as you know, Dr. Wood started a court case, which I don't know whether you'll talk about that, but we did mention that briefly last week. And also, Dr. Morgan Reynolds, uh, at the same time, also filed a court case with a sort of, uh, similar, on a similar basis, basically. One, Dr. Woods was about the buildings, and, uh, Dr. Reynolds' case was about the alleged plane crashes. So I'll paste that link in the chat window in a minute, and then people can go and listen to the Rodriguez clip that that will, that will be on that link, and see what they think of that. Okay, thanks. You see, what I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to leave my uh, radio weekly show open to Dr. Julie Wood to get as much information. I want to come back next week, week after five weeks, ten weeks. I don't care how many weeks until we get every single nuance of 9-11, every stone unturned, every nook and cranny, every detail, until there's no doubt in left in people's minds. And then I want to get the cover-up completely exposed so you know who you're dealing with when, when these people are talking and then people who are supporting these people, you've got to wonder whether they're supporting these people because they know the, the truth and they're covering it up or they're supporting these people because they've been duped, like I was, like you was, like... Everybody who's listening to this who thinks nukes were involved, bombs were involved, thermite were involved, there's because too that's, much that's, evidence. Those are assumptions. That's what, yeah, yes, yeah, they yeah, are. But look, look at this, what's there. It, it takes a lot of discipline to, to do that. After talking to after, Dr. Judy Wood for, for, for a long time... Um, you get your knuckles hit with quite, a ruler. <laughs> it's quite clear that there's too much evidence. We don't need to look at any other event. You don't need to make assumptions. You don't have, need theories or assumptions. Like right, for, 9-11 for example, has, put, got it, has got it all. Yeah, and put, it's, put this, it's even um, got a remedy. It's even got a remedy if we can get to the remedy. We've got a yeah, remedy. It, pop, this, is, this link that I just put in the in the uh, Skype window, the ends of 304 yeah. at the end, uh, check out that uh, that image. That's that's the remains of Building 7. When people say it was a irregular controlled demolition, um, explain how uh, the building turned to mud. It's a big mud pie. Yeah, how's the building turn to mud? Under it. It was uh, made out of okay. jello pullet pudding. It, right. It might, oh it might yes. Well, what, what date is this on? Uh, let's see. Do I have the date of it in there? I don't know if I have the date of, of this in there. Um, but I I have it in my book. It, it's right. it's not not long afterwards. Not uh, long afterwards. 
Yeah, it's because they 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 got the, this was the first spot they cleaned up quickly, but they the dirt appeared like overnight. Everything was covered with dirt, mud. So do you want to talk about the mud then? Because we didn't even cover that last week. So we'll we'll have something fresh because we pretty much over. We've just gone over everything we did last week, but in more depth and from different pictures and different okay. angles. Okay, on on that so, uh, a hot page or the you know the WTC page. If you go to the index yeah. of it, and yeah, uh, N is dirt. If you click dirt, on that, that button, yep. you go you go to this, and you can look at you know figure ninety in this section uh, at, okay. at the top of it. Um, if you look closely, do a blow up of that, you see it looks like fresh potting soil that just arrived. That picture is was uploaded on the FEMA site on the sixteenth, it, so it was taken before that day. And you know here's you know. Bunch of fresh potting soil it, with with crisp boundaries to it, like it was just brought in with a wheelbarrow and plop, dumped there, or or a backhoe or something. Same with figure ninety one. So that's that's within five days, and there's no well, footprint in that soil. Figure ninety one was uploaded in the system on the thirteenth of September two thousand one. It could have been taken on that day or the day after, but not you know it no later than the thirteenth. Now, if you do a, a blow up of that picture. That's uh, figure 91. Yep. Uh, that's the 3885 JPEG. I'll, I'll give you right. that link here. I, I, uh, it's already in chat window. It's already there. I've done it. Okay, good. Uh, you notice that this, you know, you get a fresh look at the clumps of dirt around there. It's not sprinkled evenly over the ground. It's in clumps. Like the on the left-hand side, kind of near in the foreground, you have a piece of aluminum cladding. You have bare parts and then clumps of dirt, like it was dumped with a wheelbarrow or something. I'm not saying how it got like that, but it's it's not sprinkled from uniform sprinkling all around. And this is like immediately after the event. But one thing that's even more important, people are saying, you know, hot steel toe boots melting and, and rivers of molten, you know, whatever the, the images of heat. Now we're going to go through some deprogramming here. Look at uh, the guy on the right, kind of in the foreground. See at the kind of the base of his feet, there's a bunch of hoses. They're oxyfuel hoses. And they run along the ground. You see a guy off in the distance on the... Near the left side of the page, left of center, yeah. he's got a he's got a torch in his hand, a cutting torch. And so you yeah. have these oxygen oxy fuel hoses all over the pile or, or debris field. I, we should train ourselves to call it debris field. And this is one of the things that Jesse Ventura was telling Alex Jones is Alex, you know, you got oxygen hose all over the, the the ground there. You wouldn't dare do that if it was hot, now would you? <laughs> he makes a very good point. Are you going to drag ho- oxy fuel hoses over the ground, a ground that's 2,000 degrees or over your grill? It was well, Gi- Giuliano who named it 2,000 degrees. Right. Yeah, so this is the area that's meant to be 2,000 degrees and they've got oxygen hoses over it. Yeah. yeah. And this is right, like, like in the next day or so. They upload the picture. Alex the might. <laughs> that's true. You never know what and, that crazy person will do. But you you see these fumes. Okay, it could, should look like it's it's uh, hot, but you know, or steam. It reminds you of steam, but don't call it steam. That's why I call it fumes, because that keeps you from making the assumption that the cause is heat. And yep. it turns out that uh, if they they wet it down or on rainy days, you don't get the fumes coming out. It, it quiets it. If it was hot steam you know from doing steam you would get more of it on a wet day okay let's look some up soil pictures okay the next picture's down uh figure 93 uh, the 93. dirt goes in the dirt goes out <laughs> right so th- that's, th- this is an interesting point because this this isn't just how long have they been doing this oh this this is uh i think this one's dated the 27th of september so you, you see those four trucks as the yellow front end. Figure ninety four is a blow up of that. You see those trucks. Yeah. Right. If you, click, yet, you click on ninety three, you get a you get a close up of that image, and you can see they got stuff in those trucks. Oh, they, they they're going to do road paving today, or is that a black tarp over dirt that they have in there? And this is one block north of the World Trade Center. They're heading south towards the World Trade Center. Right. So how so, do you explain uh, what, why, why they just decided to drive down that street, you know, on that day with, uh, you know, some some kind of material in their truck? 
Um, no, I mean, what I'm getting is, when you arrived, or you've been to the site with Andrew Johnson a, a good few oh, we'll, years we'll later. Get, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. This is we're talking okay, about. Right. It's just a few days after 9/11. A few we days had four after 9/11. Yellow, these trucks with a yellow cab on them that have right. something in them. It looks like they have a tarp over them, and they're driving into Ground Zero. Now, Figure 95. Click on that one. Okay. Here they are driving out. There. Uh, this is Liberty Street. And uh, the, you see the ten and ten firehouse there. If we could turn around, and look 180 degrees behind us. That is where Building Four used to stand. So this is it, this Bankers Trust on the right, and they're going through this kind of a, a check station where they're, they're they have that gizmo that pulls the tarp over the truck. And look at the white truck there. It looks like loaves of bread rising. It's smooth. Now the green truck yeah. has you know junk in it, but the the, the white one. It looks smooth, like smooth dirt. Same with the one in front of it, the one in front of that. And they're, uh, yeah. you know, hosing them down and, and covering them with the tarp. And when uh, I was there in the fall of 2007 with Russ Gerst and Morgan Reynolds, um, but I think he had already left, but uh, Russ Gerst and I were walking around, and, and I think it was Russ who said, Oh, look, 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 he's opening up the gate. He's opening up the gate. So get Kim ready. And it was actually this very intersection. And here they were hosing down the track, coming out, and they, the, uh, cover didn't quite come over at the tarp, but the guy pulled up a few, you know, like half a block up, stopped, got out, and somebody else hopped in, he got in the driver's seat and, and drove off. So the guy who drove the truck out from inside, the, you know, behind the, the, the gate with the hidden, you know, fence, he drove out just like a block, and then another driver took over to drive it off to who knows where. And when, yep. when's this? When's that this image? Fall of 2000. This image we're looking at is right after 9-11. But the, the one that I'm talking about, and I have pictures of that on my website too in the, in the dirt series. But that was, right. uh, that was in fall of 2007. There was still trucking dirt in and out. The dirt comes 2007. in. 2007. So six yep. years later, they're still putting dirt in and out. Yeah. This particular picture here is from right after 9-11. And, the, and that's Bankers Trust on your right. And you see the red traffic light? And for them, you yes, can see there, there's a guy that who's checking. He's got a white shirt on or something. He's checking to make sure the, the the top is down. I don't know if they have a temporary scales there to, to measure right. the weight of something leaving, but that's dirt being trucked out. As well as that green truck has junk in it, but you know, yeah. more than just dirt. But the other ones, it it's very uniform looking. Like like when was the when was the latest uh, when, when was the latest time you were there to see this? Uh, well, I was there with Andrew in January 2008. And there's fumes coming out of the ground, dirt coming in, dirt going out. Still fuming in 2008, and there's yeah, dirt not, coming it, in and out. It, it quieted down quite a bit. Now, if you look at, uh, here's September 2007, figure 92. You look at that one. You can argue as to why they're doing whatever they're doing, but that's a lot of dirt. Why are they hauling dirt out? You know, they bring dirt in, you stir it around, took it back out. Maybe they're using it to stabilize something. They, they were, you know, making a, 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 a deeper bathtub wall, but they're trucking dirt in and out. And that, that's nice dirt. That's fresh potting soil looking. I mean, it's a nice, rich looking dirt. That's not just gravel for, you know, weighting something down. That's, it's really nice looking dirt. Would, would you say? That's bizarre behavior. That's top that's soil. Bizarre. Yeah, it's bizarre behavior. Yeah, you can look for the explanation, and you know, just but we're we're witnessing they're just trucking dirt in and out for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so, uh, and we of course have the uh, audio recording of Rudy, Rudy Giuliani the morning on the tw of the twelfth talking about we had hundred you know twenty dump trucks, uh, you know, carrying stuff out, or, you know, coming and going over overnight. And they'll be working all throughout the day today, uh, as though he's planning on cleaning things up by 5 p.m. <laughs> I, I think that I think the point is, um, if they're shipping tr stuff out, you could say they were ex excavating or digging or doing something. But if, if it's becoming well, in as well, that's got raises some serious questions on what they're doing. Right. Also, that that, that white truck we saw going out with, looks like bread loaves in there. I mean, it's nice, smooth yeah. around the top. It's very uniform looking. Uh, what are you doing hauling that out instead of looking for for people to, to save? If you're if you're dislodging, you ever play the game pick up sticks? You think of a whole bunch of pencils and you you know long skinny you know or straw or something. Then you you dump them and then 
it, you, you, the game is to see if you can pull how many sticks you can pull out before you have an avalanche. Well, if you're looking to rescue people, you need to. You don't want to disturb the pile. You want to see if you can get between the nooks and crannies without dislodging those sticks. So what are they doing hauling, you know, the sticks out before they've rescued people or look to see if there's anybody to rescue? So it, it doesn't make sense that they'd be hauling steel beams out. If you're looking for people, you don't want to, you know, be hauling out beams and, you know, large uh, weight of stuff. Okay. Have you got the? Uh, shall we talk about the people? Because they did find someone, didn't they, in the in the dust? Uh, yeah. Um, we can play that uh, audio. Let's see. Um, do I, I have that on a, uh, a web page? I think. Let's see. Um, uh, this is. I'm gonna, I think it's. I'm. I'm going to the Towers series and page eight, and I. I mean, I hope it's there. Um. I have pages, uh, take a bit of time to load up. On the video page? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, on the, not on the video page, I'm on the, um, Towers series. The ones that go with chapter eight. Uh, let's okay, see. Okay, I'm with you. I'm, 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 don't remember if it was I'm there we up. saw it or, um, no, maybe it was on the video page. I thought you played it from your computer. Yeah, I thought you did too, so, uh, I'm trying to remember where it is, um, it's, uh, uh, let's see, um, I mean, okay, the, the, yeah, the video page is at the top, I'm gonna, uh, open that up, I hope I, my puny memory can handle it all, um, that's the steel turning to dust and, um, yeah, they, they uh, were acknowledging that the building turned to dust. Oh, oh, here's a good one. I, well, I'm getting that one loading. Um, this is uh, getting ready to pull bill at six. The guy from I think it's a North Carolina accent. Uh, we discussed this last week. The, they had to pull it down with ropes because the dead. Right, was right. So exploded. here we could. I'm going to play that one now while the other page is loading. Just to, you know, make some. Uh, here. Ready to pull bill at six. We have to be very careful how we demolish Building 6. We were worried about the Building 6 coming down and then damaging the red slurry wall, so we wanted that particular building to fall within a certain area. Well, we got the cables attached in four different locations going up. They'll be pulling, pulling the building to the north. It's not every day you try to pull down an eight-story building with cables. They're worried about it hurting the slurry wall. That's another term for the bathtub. They made it out of slurry to begin with, it, so they often refer to it as a slurry wall. Uh, the, that little remaining chunk of um, the western chunk of Building 6 was right adjacent to the bathtub wall. If they used a stick of dynamite, they were worried about it damaging the bathtub wall. Uh, uh, you know, just a little stub of, a six, of an eight-story building. Right. And... Um, Anyway, so let's see, uh, that other, uh, the video well, we page is looked, now... Uh, we possibly could have looked at the, um, all of building four and six before we looked at how they pulled it down, because you, 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 you haven't got inside to that building. It's, it's yeah, cold. yeah, I just playing that one. Uh, let's see, uh, where is that one? Um, I don't remember where I saw that one. I don't Unless know. Unless, maybe it's on the dirt, it, maybe, I don't know if it's the dirt series. Uh, or was it in a, in a um, or was it in a, in a video? Maybe it was the actual video itself that I have on my, my computer. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, and let's see. No. Uh, uh, well, I'm looking at the one with the, the woman. Oh, um, I don't know if it's, a, we won't bother to cover the, Building seven thing right now just yet, but uh, this uh, this one with this clip I have of this uh, medical person being interviewed with building seven behind her. Are you playing and, that now? 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting ready to, and it, I'm just going to describe it because it's, it's on my computer. But you have a copy okay, of no it. Problem. That yeah, uh, I'll, I'll put it into the video. Yeah, I'm, I'm she, she's being together. she's being interviewed, and you see Building Seven right behind her. And the Building Seven, you'll see the Building Seven just start going down, and then the people who are watching the interview and see that say, "Oh yeah, ah!" And then she she turns around and says, "What what what happened? What happened?" You know, she has no idea what happened. She didn't hear anything dropping behind her. She didn't hear any bombs going off behind her. She didn't know where to look. Like, where, 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 where I look? And then they said Building 7 just, just collapsed. And she said, no, no, it already went down. That tells you how coherent people were about what was what. They didn't know what building's what. You know, it's, uh, all right, here we no go. No bangs, no explosion. No bangs and no explosions. And it's right yeah. in behind her. Yeah, and I'll play it as loud as I can. Yeah, she's, she's getting interviewed. Hold on, yeah, we're quick. Take two seconds to fire this up. Hold on. Speak. Go. Your name, ma'am? Barbara Crowley. C-R-O-W-L-E-Y. NYU Medical Center. Okay, tell me okay. what you know. All I know at this point is they're trying to establish an outdoor hospital facility like we've set up at Chelsea Piers, a triage like unit, for the, the personnel that are attending to the scene, not to the injured in the scene. They can't get in to get any casualties out at this time. They don't know the extent of it at this point. What we're doing now is going to get medical supplies to bring down trauma physicians down here to set up the surgical unit and the uh, the triage unit down here. In addition to, if anybody out there can help, any vendors yeah. who have food or supplies, the firemen have no food, nothing but snacks. They need fluids, they need water, and they need protein foods. This is just the beginning of what they're facing. So we're and we need masks. We need TB masks. Holy shit! What is it? What just went down? What just went down? World Trade Seven. It did go down before. No, seven. Number seven. Oh my God! Hey, here she, hey, what, what, what happened? You know, she's turned around. Look, you know, she didn't know where to look. She didn't hear anything. No pops. No, no pop. Pickles. But 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 from the way the cameras aimed, you can see the building in the, you know behind her, building seven. But but she she's reacting to the gasps from the audience. You can hear people from distance away are getting picked up on, you know, their, their old microphone, so, but you don't hear other stuff. And she obviously didn't hear bangs and pops because she, she was surprised that, you know, I'll play that section. It's right around the middle of that video and I'll play it again. Help any vendors who have food or supplies. The firemen have no food, nothing but snacks. They need fluids, they need water, and they need protein foods. This is just the beginning of what they're facing. So we're, and we need masks. We need TB masks. Holy shit! What is it? Just went down. What just went down? World Trade Seven. It did go down before. No, seven. Number seven. Oh. So she didn't. She didn't know what, what, what you know what building was what. I I was wondering about that myself. Like you know, I was talking to a, a firefighter. I mean, a a police officer who was was on the scene, and I said, "Well, did you notice anything missing? Like uh, <clears throat> a couple of buildings or so? You know, two or three buildings." He goes, "Well, we didn't know where we were. All of our landmarks." We couldn't see, you know, everything was the same color. You didn't know where you were. So you didn't know, realize what was missing and what wasn't. You just, you know, everybody was kind of in a tailspin and numbed. It's unbelievable. I, I also have uh, uh, the CNN. Uh, you know, few people realize, you know, when they talk about the BBC gal with, you know, foreknowledge. If foreknowledge came from CNN. She's just reporting what she, what she heard on CNN. I mean, CNN announced it earlier, and the next day CNN was even announcing that uh, a premature announcement of uh, One Liberty Plaza. <clears throat> One Liberty uh, Plaza is still standing. Have you got the CNN announcement of Building Seven? Yeah, yeah. It, you don't. I, I can't play this over the thing. Well, you can add it into the um, when you make the video of this. But it's the right. the ticker across the bottom of the screen says, you know, confirmed. Partial collapse of One Liberty Plaza. Confirmed? Apparently, somebody saw a piece of glass falling out of a window, and everybody panicked, and they evacuated, like, oh, the building's coming down. Somebody thought they saw the building twisting. And All right, here's... Uh, whoops. I opened up my window further. I had to make the window wider. Okay, here, here it is. Judy? All right, Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Now, quickly, back to Aaron. Judy, thanks. I'm just going to say off to the side here, and, and they're watching the camera it. to stay focused on the scene. We were keeping our eye on that gray building in... I'm going to stop for a minute. They're, they're, they're so worked up and their nerves are so on edge. They're, it's like they want to catch it falling because they think it's about to fall and they've evacuated the area and, and they've got that in the picture, uh, in the picture frame here. 
I wish I could see the monitor better. Let me just look at it in roughly the, the tallest building I think you can see. Gary Tuckman, who has been down on the ground, and in fact, one of the few civilians into the ground zero area. Uh, Gary, can you hear me? Gary Tuckman, are you able to hear me now? Aaron, I hear you fine. I, I want to tell you, an hour and 15 minutes ago, as you said, I was at ground zero with one to 2,000 rescue and recovery workers at the scene. They are all being evacuated as we speak. Most of them are now gone because of that one Liberty Plaza building, which is just to the east of the World Trade Center complex. We have talked to rescue workers who tell us they saw the building starting to twist and then said they saw some windows starting to break. Well, we're, we're, we are seeing the windows breaking from where we're standing. We can see the windows falling out or facing falling out. Okay, you have another angle, and you certainly have a better angle than me, because from our angle, and we're to the north of the building, we haven't seen the windows, so it's interesting information. I want to tell you, Aaron, that there are a lot of people who are at the site who are very frightened by that, because they had told us while we were there that they were quite worried about one or two of the buildings surrounding the World Trade Center complex. They had told us that while we were there, and now they're living through it. We can also tell you the media has been pushed back several blocks also from the perch that we were at about four blocks away from the World Trade Center complex. It's like they're so convinced that building's coming down that they want to they want to they want to watch it. They, you know, they evacuate the area. It was twisting and you know broke windows coming out. Um, that building is still standing to this day. Structurally sound. Yep. It was right across the street from Building Four, diagonally across from the Burger King. It was a fifty-four story building. That's a big building. That's bigger than than Building Seven. And and somebody thought they saw it twisting. It, it, that's a frightened person. They're all frightened, and and they're all like on edge. Like you know, yeah, this, these buildings just just went away, and what's going to happen next? They they don't know. They're not looking back in history. They're they're living it, and. It, it it would be pretty frightening because you don't know if a bomb is about to go off or what's going to happen, and they and they want to make sure they you know they, they they start running in time. It's unbelievable. But it, it says really at the is. bottom of the of the screen it says confirm one Liberty Plaza partially collapsed. Okay, uh, some you know cracked pieces of, of window glass came loose and fell down. Is that partially collapsed? But it's it's that they're just so on edge. So imagine what they were like on nine eleven. Just just you know, like we heard that. Uh, uh, let's see, it was a first responder said he heard that that uh, airplane crashed into uh, the Empire State Building. I actually heard a recording of from one of the choppers who had heard that the White House was on fire or the Capitol was on fire. It's just word of mouth they're passing around, so rumors are going to bounce around until something gets absolutely confirmed. I forgot what I asked, which clip I asked you to look for now. I'm, I'm completely. I've, I've uh, it, it, I was, it was the one with the, the doctor. Um, I I don't remember where that one is. Uh, I, did, I don't have it in this stash. So that's why I think it was on a page. Maybe it's on. Um, would it be on my... Because uh, we also looked at the Dirt series. Yeah, we did. So it might be on that. Um, that would be... Uh, um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and leave this one. Um, I think it's... It, Dr. Judy would... No, that didn't work. Um drjwood.com slash articles slash dirt uh, that's where that series is it's um, and I'm, I th I, I'm wondering if it is from this one uh, oh yeah we, we did look at number uh, page 2 and 3 so let's see if this is uh Uh, that fuzzball business. Uh, let's see, it's it's not there. I'm, I'm looking on three now. Is that one was? Um, I tried around the ones we we looked at, but I um, 
forget where that was. There's still shots. There's Rudy Giuliani. There's the Gestapo picture. Um, but this this one's a pretty significant one. Ah, I found it. Yep, it's on uh, dirt. It's on dirt uh, four page. But uh, I think we saw it from somewhere else. But um, let's see if I can open it up in YouTube. Yep. All right. At ten thirty, I tried to leave the building, but as soon as I got outside, I heard a second explosion and another rumble and more smoke and more dust. I ran inside the buildings. The chandelier shook, and again, black smoke filled the air. Within another five minutes, we were covered again with more silk and more dust. Now, just because you hear the word explosion doesn't mean an explosive. You know, like put put an egg in your microwave oven and listen carefully. Yeah, it, you, you're going to hear something explode. And what you actually should see if bombs are going off, you would you would see a bang bang. You know, hear a bang 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 and see a bang 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 bang. But they're these people are interpreting things the best they Fire can. Marshall came in and said um, we had to leave but, because if there was. But, but it, let's see if I can find. Uh, okay, I think this is it. Yep, this is it. It's around the two minute mark. Where are all the people? They ask. They ask these physicians. Where are all the people? And the first doctor they ask, you know, these are people who care about human beings. That's why they went into medicine. And and this 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 first doctor they ask, he's. He's going into this engineering explanation. He, he can't handle the discomfort, the implications. He can't handle So he goes into this engineering rationalization for why the buildings went down. And then another one, they, they talk about you know, pulling people out. So I'm going to play it now. Yeah, I'm starting the 209 mark. Here we go. Dr. Tony Donner, he and his partner, Dr. Lincoln Cleveland, are emergency room physicians from New York University Hospital downtown. We, we saw all our casualties yesterday at our hospital. It stopped at about noon. It got really strange and very spooky. It just it, things just stopped coming in that had anything to do with the with the blast. Uh, now, isn't that that doesn't make sense for a collapsed building? They're only dealing with you know rescue workers that got injured, not anybody from the building. And it's by noon they stopped coming in. All right, I'm going to continue here. And, you know, at the time I was thinking. You, you can read a couple things into that. Either people are buried and they're going to start bringing bodies out, or just everybody died. Where are all the people who were in these buildings? The buildings were built. The structural support of the building is the shell, is the skin of the building. I remember when they were built. This is a doctor. The innovative architecture, architecture of it is that the, the outer shell is where the strength of it is. And I think what happened is the whole thing imploded. It was like a shoot that went straight down. What does that mean to the inside? It means that the explosion has nowhere to go except down. Um, I think another building collapses, there's toppling, pieces fall off, there's a diffusion of the energy, and in this collapse, the energy all went straight down. And I think that, tragically, if anybody in that shoot did not survive. I mean, it probably had the force of close to a nuclear blast. All right, I'm going to stop for a second and say, because they changed the scene here, uh, that if all the force went down, we would have a seismic chart that showed, you know, an impact on the ground. We just had a surface wave, which is is consistent with the weight being lifted off. You don't longer have the two 500,000 ton buildings sitting there. Instead, you know, pretend King Kong reaches over and grabs a building and just chucks it up in outer space. You know, just for a mental model, you don't have that weight on anymore, like getting off your mattress. You know, when you get up, it recovers, it bounces back. That's different than a hammer going bang, bang, bang on the bedrock. So, you know, if it really did go straight down, it would it'd be like a big, huge hammer on the bedrock. It would be like hitting a tuning fork with a hammer. And that didn't happen. But he's. This is a medical doctor. He's just. He's trying to explain it because he, he he he's struggling. What what information he's giving us is that what he saw happening. He can't. He, he doesn't have an explanation for it. So he's just reaching as hard as he can to try to explain it away. Yeah, because you know we're all the people. That you heard the silence before. That he was very uncomfortable with that question. 
and they just had to, you know, come up with some explanation. And you can see from his expression, he's just, he's in pain, he's traumatized. It's, it doesn't add up. You should have a lot of bodies. Um, but here they're going to talk about, they, they pulled out, uh, they're going to ask some firefighters, and the firefighters thought they pulled out two, but then the doctor talks about one, and he was in good shape. He came from the 80-something floor. Right, that's this part. These firemen from Brooklyn have been taking the mountain down piece by piece, and many of them share the pessimism of the doctors. It's what? Just huge rubble. Do you, do you see anything of the victims of the people who were in the building? Yeah, I'm stories on top of uh, everybody over there. It's, it's just tough to say. 110 stories on top that's of everybody. That's right. But the two buildings work. If we get a shot, you see the antenna that was on top of the tower. It's at ground level. And yet there are no people to be seen. Well, they got a couple of Port Authority cops alive. Last night, last night, this morning. I suppose they were like on the 80th floor from what we heard. But uh, that's it. So I was here when they executed the police officer at 8 o'clock this morning, who was in very good shape, actually, amazingly enough. Um, I think right now it's just going to be a very slow process of digging through rubble. You know, Doctor, it seems to me that it must be very frustrating to be a physician and to have really so few patients to treat here. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know the numbers yet, but I, I certainly hope that means that a lot of people made it out alive. And, uh, obviously, it's horrific and incredible tragedy for those people who lost their lives. What do you make of this? Words fail. Words fail. That that was the best statement of all. Yeah, he, he couldn't he couldn't explain it. Words fail. But it was above the 80th floor is where the, this firefighter was. I mean, a police officer was, and he was <laughs> in good shape. And there was somebody else who was on the 22nd floor. He called him the surfer. He ended he up. He literally right. He just rode down the dust cloud. That, that, it, as, it, as the story goes, but what is is uh, that's his experience. But what we do know is that where those uh, people came out of stairwell B, it, what was left is four stories worth of stairwell B. The surfer landed right on top of that. So if those guys in stairwell B had walked up the stairs, you know, looked there, there they would have found the the surfer. He was, he was laying there right on top of uh, the landing of the fourth floor. That's why I think there's something special about Stairway B that that didn't totally, uh, you know, toast the building. What I mean by toast is, you know, in, in U.S. that term is used for its history. It's toast, you know, totally destroyed. You know, you can't re- beyond be repair. But what is interesting is they talk about this, somebody on the uh, above the 80th floor, 82nd floor, I think they said, I'm not sure. But above the 80th floor, uh, a Port Authority police officer, and he was in relatively good shape. How on earth could he be in relatively good shape? Absolutely. If it were a pancake and collapse, it would have been squashed. If it were, oh, just... It should, <laughs> if it was if I, bombs going off, they'd be, they'd, be, they'd be blown to bits by, if not sitting on yeah. the bomb, but, but having a piece of flying debris hit them. And um, the, the, also the stairwell B survivors, the 14 people there, uh, they weren't squashed, they weren't crushed, they weren't burned up. They walked out, went home. Um, they probably took them to the hospital to see if they're okay first, but, and, and the guy, the surfer went home that night. That's incredible. You know what happened to the, the policeman from the 80th floor? Did he go to the hospital? I, what are you I, I haven't much? tracked him down, I, and I sort of I hesitate on getting, you know, identifying or, or, or whatever, because, uh, he's been through enough, and let him decide when to reveal himself. Like the surfer kept it inside for 10 years, and, had, you know, survivor's guilt and other issues going on, you know, which you can completely understand. I mean, that's, it's a horrendous thing. And then finally start to talk about it. But, uh, imagine, you know, how the, the people in the truth movement just, they go attack these people. Like, like, you know, okay, I'm going to divert a little bit, talk about Sandy Hook, calling up families who've lost, you know, family members, calling them up and, and how would you feel if you'd lost a child and then somebody say, you're lying, you didn't have a child. Unless you're absolutely sure, why do that to somebody? 
or or tell us about your story. Tell us about your, you know. It, leave these people alone. They didn't choose to be there. They didn't choose for that to happen to them. And so, I, you know, that I have a lot of respect for these survivors and the victims, and you know, let them, you know, control their life. That was definitely an out of control situation. That's horrible. Like another one is Patricia Androvic, and she's been, you know, was uh, got after by by uh, truthers and, went, and refused to talk to anybody else. But she has an interesting story. The buildings blowing up, her cars are blowing up as she's running down the street. She talks about her hair being on fire, and then her coat. She couldn't see where she was going because the dust went up and blocked out all the sunlight. But then her coat lit up, and, and it seemed to be she described being on fire, but she never described any burns. And her coat was not, you know, a human flashlight. She was a human torch. Her shoelaces caught on fire. Well, what she describes catching on fire. But she didn't talk about suffering from any burns. She didn't talk about being hit by anything, you know, wasn't hit in the head by anything. Hmm. And that was right. Talk about the, was, the, no. You want to talk about the dust and um, the, maybe the dust roll out? Ah, so yeah, it's a. Um, let's see if I if we have that on the uh, aha page. Um, let's see. Do, I don't know if I have the dust roll out there or not. Uh, fuzzy buzz, rolled up carpets. Because the dust didn't just roll out in like in yeah. I don't think way. I have it. I don't think I have it specified yeah, so um, that way here. Yeah, but yeah, it it uh, bullet, it's, it? it rolls out and then it goes up. Now there's a couple of you know. Just superficially, you know, identifying that without getting into the fine details, what it appears to be, you know, think, think of this. You have a handful of gravel and you're going to throw it. And it goes a certain distance. Now, if you have the same amount of mass in your hand as flour and try to throw it, it's not going to go very far because the, the fine pieces have a lot more surface area, which would be, which would cause resistance. And so, you know, gravel flies further for the same amount of mass than, you know, Fine pulver, you know, dustified flour. Now, what happens if you throw that gravel and it turns into into you know dust like flour midway on its journey of throwing it? It's not going to f- fly as far as it otherwise would because it now has more more uh, wind resistance. And uh, then you know, he so said the dust cloud looks like it rolls out a certain distance and quits rolling out and then goes up. And this video by Bob and Bree, you might want to add that in later. I don't, I'm not going to look it up now. But we're, um, it, it rolls out and doesn't quite touch their window. It's beautiful. They, they close the, the window and they're filming right out the window. Oh, oh yeah. When, when they're, when they're filming, here's the tower starting to come apart and it just sounds like a big waterfall. You don't hear a bang, 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 pop, 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 crunchity, poppity, bangity, boomity. You don't hear that. That's what you would hear with, with a collapse. Or you don't hear a bang, 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 bang. You, you would hear with a controlled demolition of bombs going off. Instead, you see this thing go shh, like waterfalls, just turning to dust as it comes down. And it was just wonderful of them to capture this on film and then share it with us. And so they're, they're filming it, and you see the dust cloud roll out. It rolls out a certain distance. It doesn't quite reach their building, and then it goes up. And, you, you know, if they open their window and reached out, you could poke the edge of the, the dust cloud. It didn't touch their window. They filmed to the right and to the left, and to the right, you can see this patch of green where they have um, boats that are, you know, carrying people off over to New Jersey to rescue, and and the grass is still green. You look to the left, and you look down the street, you know, all the way across you know, Manhattan, and you see the dust only went so far, and then it went up. So it ran out of momentum because it was continuing to break down into smaller pieces as it was yes, traveling. Yeah, there's, there's, you can see that there's some kind of a process going on. The, this, the simplest way to look at it is it went finer and finer and finer. Why it goes up, that's another issue. But but uh, it, it you know quits rolling out all the, about the same time, and then it goes up. Now, that is not what controlled demolition dust does. First of all, in regular controlled demolitions, you don't get dust much higher than the original height of the building. And the dust doesn't happen until the building slams the ground, you know, the majority of it. You use bombs to slice and dice the building so the chunks drop down and slam to the ground. They use, you know, kinetic energy from gravity. And they slam it down to the ground, it busts up into pieces, and you get some dust, you know, squirting out and going wherever. But really doesn't go much above the original height of the building. And I've got several examples in my book. Our book, Where'd the Towers Go? 
And uh, in the Seattle Kingdom, when that went, went away or got blown up, it was pretty interesting uh, that in the newspaper they said, wow, dust filled all of downtown for almost 20 minutes. Yeah, I think the World Trade Center, uh, 20 months maybe. <laughs> it, it, it definitely wasn't 20 minutes. No, but you've got um, the the top of one of the buildings when it tw- twisted. That but, 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 hang on, that, let's let, let's keep with this. So the dust rolled out and then went up, and that is not anything like a controlled demolition. No, it proves that the, it, the dust was continuing to get smaller and smaller and smaller it, as it was going forward. Or something, an ongoing process. We can say that much. That it, it, we haven't proved that it gets smaller. We, we, what you've proved is that there's a process going on that stops it from rolling out. Because if if you were ahead of that dust cloud as it's rolling out, uh, you know, first it's a little bit quick, so you have to you know work up to a trot with your, your briefcase. You run down the street, and then as you get near that uh, pedestrian bridge by Stuyvesant School, uh, you, you can walk down. You can slow down to a brisk walk, and, and still stay ahead of the dust cloud. Then it, the dust cloud stops right at the bridge, and we do have uh, that video. Uh, let's see. Let's see. There, here's uh, here's a link there, and um, there. It, it, the, and the media is talking about the building turned to dust. But you can watch as it's approaching the the bridge. Watch how the people who are you know trotting along at a you know a gentle jog, and then they slow down to a brisk walk to stay just ahead of the dust cloud. They're not too worried about just they just want to stay ahead of the dust cloud. Sample on a again. police car turned out dangerous. Another sample a couple of blocks away, not dangerous. But most interesting in the mix, they are looking. They think at specks of steel that used to be beams and elevators. Look at the people on the ground, the lobby floor and facings. So, what were once the strongest architectural elements in the two towers were pulverized. Large portions turned into clouds, like this one. Still, there is this mystery: if some of the hardest materials were vaporized, how to account for the presence everywhere of paper? Fully intact letters, business forms, stationery. Paper is so fragile and combustible, and yet somehow, maybe because we have so much of it, it was everywhere. You talk about all the constituents of the building, essentially, were turned to dust. Except for paper. It was floating around. It wasn't stuck to anything. Um, But you see right where it's coming up to the bridge, and that's right where the dust quits rolling out. You can see it from a, a, a... helicopter picture you see the white dust on the on the ground just boom an abrupt line and I can tell you that was the dust cloud from Tower 1 you know how I know that Tower 1 was a block was built it was a block further north of Tower 2 Tower 2 went first and it rolled out to a block before the bridge so they rolled out the same distance and stopped and then when when Tower 1 came down it rolled past where Tower 2's you know stop line was and went one block further to the bridge and then stopped it's like the same amount of time they rolled out, same amount of distance they rolled out, whatever, you know, and it's the same process going on. But you see these people jog, you know, kind of a, a gentle jog, and then they, they realize, okay, I've got enough distance ahead of that dust cloud, and you start walking at a brisk pace. The people who weren't that far away from it, who were closer, they see this dust cloud, and they're trying to run for their lives. You, you know, you've seen those pictures of somebody terrified with the dust cloud bearing down on them. The dust cloud overtook them, kept on going, and it just left them covered with dust. They had trouble breathing, but left them covered with dust. And they, they uh, you know, had to stick their face in their armpit to use their clothing as a filter, air filter, because of the dust. But they didn't get burned up. So it's not a pyroclastic cloud. It just was dust. And there's another interesting uh, thing that a first responder noticed. You know, firefighters are afraid of smoke because it means that the oxygen has been displaced out of the air. That's why they have their tanks that they wear. But here, here's all this, uh, you know, fumes, I'm going to call it generically. And, and the guy's realizing, wait, this is only dust. All right, you know, like hot dig, like we should celebrate. It's not smoke. We can breathe. And no reports yeah. of burns. Right, no reports of burns. The dust was not hot. Actually, uh, some of the first responders said that initially the dust cloud felt cooler than ambient temperature. They thought maybe because it, you know, came down from so high up that, you know, it brought the cool air with it. It was cooler than ambient temperature. That's not hot. 
but then it started eating kind of itchiness on the skin and and like um you know if you uh, pour acid on your hand if even if the acid you took out of the refrigerator and it's cool it would feel hot because it was eating up your skin yep. and that's how your senses would perceive it so if somebody described it as warm or hot it could be from that reason but if you stuck a thermometer into it that doesn't get affected by by that it, it would probably show lower than an ambient temperature and that is a very important piece of data. Similar to eating a chili. Well, it's, it's, ta- you talk about where'd the energy come from? That wasn't energy being added in, that was energy be- being taken out of the environment. If it's cooler than ambient temperature. Yeah. Ah, I see so what you mean. Why, why is the refrigerator colder? Because the heat yep. is taken out and put elsewhere. Yeah. So there's something that took the, the, the heat energy, you know, took some heat energy out. Yep. The, oh, so, was, so like somebody says oh, how much oh, energy, oh, oh, hang on, so somebody says how much energy did it take? Well, what kind of energy? Maybe it took negative amount of energy because, you know, it, it pulled energy from the environment. If it's cooler than ambient temperature, it's, uh, it's not exothermic reaction, it's endothermic. It's taking heat from you know, around there and uh, using that. Yeah. It's a yeah, I was okay. thinking about the, uh, the 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 top of the building where it twists and it doesn't fall. Oh, the, oh, the the tipping top. Uh, the tipping top, because that, that's more evidence of dust breaking. Uh, let's see if uh, we know uh, where that is. I, I don't have these videos very well um, organized uh, or lined up. There's you know, so many different things, that, that I haven't looked at it for if a long time. If you just want to talk about it, if you just talk about it, I'll put it in behind. Yeah, okay. It, it, what it does is uh, the, the tipping top starts to tip. Now, later on, we can look at up-close photos and see it doesn't tip as a unit. you you got you know kinks in that in the, in the corner. You notice it's it's already crumbling into sections, but but let's let's assume it's you know you, you get this uh, you know a quote plane crash. You get a plane shaped hole in the building. We won't we won't argue about how it got there, but you have this this damage at what what was it on the south tower? It was like uh, the seventy second floor plus or minus or seventy third, seventy fourth, somewhere in the seventies, uh, and then from there on up you get this when you know fifty some odd minutes later you get that tipping top that starts to tip over and hinges right at that point okay if the top is hinging see the building below that you know has the weight on it but that part above it wouldn't be affected by this unless you, you say the fumes went up and did something to it so it starts tipping over starts to rotate over and it appears to stop rotating and you know various truthers have said oh it violates the laws of, uh, of physics no it doesn't doesn't it doesn't have to if, if it's a rigid body and it stops tipping, that violates the laws of conservation of angular momentum. But it, but if it's obeying the laws of physics, that means it, 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 it as a unit it stopped tipping, but all little particles in, inside of it continue rotating. That would maintain the conservation of angular momentum. So what that image does is prove that the building turned to dust. It's another proof. Or it's consistent with that. So the tipping top starts to tip over and appears to stop tipping because it is already turning to dust. It's no longer a rigid unit tipping. All the little what? elements are continuing to rotate internally, you know, the little tiny things. That's why the yep. whole thing doesn't look like it keeps rotating. Yeah, it doesn't. As a unit, it ceases to be a rigid body at that point. That's how it obeys uh, the laws of physics. So it doesn't violate the laws of physics. It appears to, if you look at it, as a solid rigid body and it doesn't come apart. But it, we know it doesn't like, violate the laws of physics, which means it has turned to dust. Yeah, if you threw a, if you threw a balloon full of flour and then you pop the balloon in mid- mid-flight, it'd just stop flying. Oh, well, here's, here's a mental model that I did. Um, get a, a, a balloon and fill it with uh, uh, water with red food coloring in it and tie it off. You know, lots of red food coloring, and put it in, in a swimming pool. All right, if you poke that, if you pop it, you're going to have a, one leak that's going to, you know, pressurize. It's going to be squirting red water out into your swimming pool. Instead, get uh, several boards with a whole bunch of nails poking out at it, and then you poke at it from all different directions. So you poke the surface of the uh, 
the uh, water balloon that's filled with red color, you poke it all over at the same time so it doesn't have it. You know, it loses pressure, so it's not going to squirt everywhere. The red blob kind of just stays. The red water just stays in there in the swimming pool in that region until the currents kind of move it around. You don't get the the squirt, long distance squirt out there. So let's let's consider uh, you're, you're going to uh, bust up the building, squash it to the ground. Well, all the air and stuff and ground up, you know, parts of the building are going to have to escape out of those windows. So they're going to have to squirt out of there mighty fast, like Mach one, Mach two. You know, halfway to the ground, it'd be having a, if it was a gravity collapse, it would be at Mach one. It would have to exceed Mach one at about halfway down to the ground. By the time it hits the ground, it's you know the center stuff getting shot out is is in excess of Mach two. Uh, you know, Mach Mach one is 767 miles per hour. It's the speed of sound, and it's you know, just a ballpark number changes. You know, slightly depending on the temperature and all, but. Um, if you, in, in pressure and whatnot, but if you do have stuff squirting out of the buildings at any kind of speed at all, all adjacent buildings are going to look machine gun fired. That didn't happen. So that's another way of of realizing if the building all turned to dust, you don't have to squirt it out anywhere. It's just there's nothing holding the pressure in. It's just you know, it's tracks. Um, yep. Also. Uh, you know, like jet, you know, jet airplanes—they do this engine run up, you know, do full throttle just to make sure that everything works before they take off. And it's kind of like they pop the parking brake and away the airplane starts, you know, accelerating down the runway. They have to design runways to handle that. And one poor uh, uh, pilot of a seven six Boeing seven sixty seven decided to do his run up on the tarmac, and he tore up the tarmac and it shot holes in the tail of his plane. Just it totally trashed the plane. Because it was you know, pulling up pieces of the tarmac just from the air currents. It pulls up pieces of the tarmac and shot them to the tail of the plane. And you bet that wasn't exceeding Mach 1. So if you had stuff squirting out of that building at Mach 1, you know, everything would be just all torn up. And that didn't happen. No. So that shows that, that shows that the building was not a sealed unit that had to squirt stuff out of the way. You, so sure, you saw a few squirts coming down. And people were calling that those squibs. Uh, you should have seen a whole lot more squirts, and that was, it was just regularly every, you know, ten floors or so. Well, uh, you know, think of all the things in the building, you know, like pressurized tanks that would, uh, you know, have to let go. How many can you list? Different kinds of pressure, pressurized tanks that would be coming apart. Well, we mentioned two last week, me, me and Andrew, we mentioned, um, water, water tanks and yep. fire extinguishers. Yeah, you know, somebody might learn in civil engineering that, you know, they can't pump water up, it's not, uh, you know, realistic to pump it up more than like 10 stories and you put it in a holding tank, you pump it up another 10 stories, another holding tank. Cause otherwise you'd have to pump it from the ground up to 110th floor. Uh, the head on that is so humongous, you'd, you'd drain out anything. <laughs> you know, you, you couldn't pump it uh, directly. So they pump it in tanks. You have all these holding tanks going up the building. And someone who worked in the building said, yeah, they, they pump the water at night so, you know, it wouldn't disturb people. They'd turn on the pumps at night and pump it up into the tanks. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is, and you know, one thing we do have eyewitness for, several eyewitnesses at ground level. Uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, you, you can say, well, those are bombs. No, that's the sound of an explosion. You don't, you don't see a bomb. You hear that an explosion. That doesn't mean it's a bomb. And I, at ground level. There were uh, firefighters who identified things that were exploding. Air tank, you know how the firefighters to you have to breathe uh, air in a smoke environment. There's, there's no air that it, you know because the, the oxygen is displaced by the um, the smoke, so they carry air tanks that have oxygen and stuff in them, so they can breathe clean air into the smoky environment. Those tanks, you know, they have plenty of tanks on. Uh, Ambulances and fire trucks, they're, they're exploding at ground level. Why would they do that? I'll, I'll read some of the, the first responder testimony. It's from my book. Uh, it's, it's talking about an ambulance. It said, it must have had, uh, Scott bottles. Those are the air tanks. Scott bottles or oxygen bottles on it. They were going off. You would hear air go, boom, and they were exploding. And then here's another one that, uh, is describing some things. This uh, fifty of these things uh, 
Anyway, uh, he says the, the Scott cylinders and the oxygen cylinders were all letting go. They were blowing up left and right. That was a different guy. And then, of course, we have uh, this, this uh, one that's been my favorite one because these descriptions are all so colorful. His boss asked him, uh, well, did you lose your vehicle? This is an EMT. Did you lose your vehicle? Huh? Uh, you know, you, you, you lose your vehicle. He says, well, we're, we're there... Uh, we're walking. I realize there are only two of us. I see my vehicle. The seats are covered. Um, I, it, I've still got my bag. I hold it like a trophy, like people collect basketballs. Check this out. He says, I haven't touched uh, whatever it was. The force was so strong it went inside the bag. So his instruments didn't look normal, it sounds like. Okay, then he says, but we were there. Vehicle 219 was, lo- was destroyed. And his boss says, was it on fire? And he answers, What? And his boss says, well, was it on fire? He says, fire? We saw the sucker blow up. We heard a boom. <laughs> now, why would uh, an ambulance explode? Why would oxygen tanks at street level, sitting on fire trucks, explode? There are pressure Although, vessels. If you weaken yeah, the walls of a pressure vessel, at some point they're, gonna, they're not going to be able to contain... You know, like, let's get an, a balloon full of air. Tie it off, you know, it's pressure vessel. Put it on a, on a puddle of acid. The acid is going to start eating through the balloon, and pretty soon, as soon as it's, it's too weak, it's going to explode because it can't hold in the pressure anymore. Absolutely. And and so, so you've got, those you've got are, yeah, detectors I'm not, I'm, taking out the metal, uh, justifying the metal of uh, the, the cylinder itself, so it's like it's, it's breaches inside the pressure. Can't, not necessarily you know, breaches. Just, All that needs to do is weaken the wall to the point that it can no longer hold that pressure. Yeah. And the pressure will cause it to rupture. It's kind of like a balloon. If if the outer nano layer of material goes, the balloon's too weak to hold the pressure in, and it'll pop. You know, that example of getting a balloon, fill it with, with air, you know, so it's pressurized, tie it off, and then set it on a puddle of, of uh, acid or something that's going to eat it, uh, maybe oil or, you know, something that's going to eat, eat through the surface. It, as soon as it eats it enough to weaken it just enough that it can no longer hold in that pressure, it's going to explode. So if you have uh, air tanks where the outer walls have been weakened from something, we don't need to say what it is, but from something, they're gonna, it's gonna to come to a point where they're gonna explode. Or different materials, like valves being affected. Um, and, you know, or this, they also are describing that the tanks will go and then boom. So, it, something was leaking before it exploded. Like maybe the thing just, you know, came unripped. Uh, so here we have identified actual things that were witnessed as exploding. That were going boom. Yeah, I don't doubt the sounds of explosions. Yep. You know, bombs go sure. boom, but not everything that goes boom is a bomb. Yep. And if it was uh, bombs going boom, you you know, bombs uh, blow things into chunks, and the chunks go flying. The chunks don't turn into dust in in mid flight. No. Also, also, explosions are accompanied by you know, uh, you know, high heat and flashes. You see a flash when it goes off. And. Uh, there's, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, my favorite clip of uh, something that's missing. If you had nukes or if you had uh, bombs going off, uh, it, enough bombs to to destroy 110 story buildings or 47 story buildings, there's something missing on 9 11. Here's what it is. That'll stick in your memory. Uh, you know, yeah. with. With, uh, uh, you know, thermite is used to weld railroad tracks and other things, and it puts off blinding light. Where was that blinding light? Well, it yeah, wasn't there. Nukes, it wasn't there. There was a few, uh, yeah, nukes there was a few strange off. fires, um, but, um, they but could that's be anything. Not blinding, yeah, it wasn't blinding light. It looked like fires, and it's, yep. you know, it's tempting to call them fires, but then we're not going to look at what they really are because we're going to assume they're fires. That's yep. what this is really is like a magic show. It's just you have to prove everything. You know when you go to court, uh, you have to prove that the uh, you know charging somebody with murder by gunshot. Okay, you have to prove that he held the gun in his hand. That there's evidence that you know on the palms of his hand that he he shot a gun. That that the bullet found in the victim matches the same kind of bullet that comes out of that gun. And 
you know, all these details that, that absolutely connect him to the crime. So it, assuming, well, we know he owns a gun, so therefore he killed this guy. You can't do that. You, you, if you start looking, though, at this, it, it, the kind of evidence you would need to prosecute this in court, you start seeing what really happened because you're no longer yep. solving an assumed problem. And so uh, uh, there's, you know, an enormous amount of really, really strange things. Well, just to talk about the strange fires, uh, today I was watching videos on YouTube where people putting steel wool inside a microwave, and it appears that the wool's on fire. Uh, well, it's steel. It's actually just nothing else in there but just wines of steel or whatever steel wool's made out of. And it, you can't burn that. It's like, but yeah. Well, it's you, you say, yeah, it does. It does. It, you, you get well. It doesn't burn like a piece of paper does. But no, if something is hot enough, it glows. And so yeah, if, if if the microwave is affecting it in such a way that it's making it do that, you know, you it would it would appear to be glowing. But a, again, uh, you know, hot things glow, but not everything that glows is hot. Now, see if you can um, name something that uh, you know glows that, that isn't hot. Like a firefly? Uh, Do you have those in in England? Fireflies? No, we don't. But we I'm surrounded with them in Thailand. Ah, so you've seen them there? Okay. They, yeah, they they're glow, but they're not hot. Well, the first time I saw them, I was so shocked. I ran and got my wife, and I said, "You've got to come and see this." And she just went, "Oh, flies!" And just walked away. Like oh, she's grown up with them, so you know. <laughs> it's just Last year we didn't see so many around here. It's like like the bees that are going away. But this year the bees were were coming back more, and fireflies were too. So it was it was a nice sight. You know, around dusk or just after dark, you see these. You know, they they it's kind of like a strobe. It's on and off. You know, as they're flying around. Yeah. The other example you use is the light bulbs. Yep, a fluorescent light bulb and an incandescent light bulb. They both glow, but only one of them is really hot. It, would you unscrew a, uh, a uh, an incandescent bulb with your bare hands that had been on for a long time? Yeah, you'd burn your hands. Absolutely. But a Absolutely. fluorescent light you can take out while it's been on for a while. It might be warm, but it's not gonna. It, you know, it's not. It's, it, they're glowing for different reasons, and the fluorescent bulb has a kind of a plasma in it. That gets excited, and that's where the light, it puts out the light from there. Instead of from uh, luminescence coming from you know heat from a you know the the tungsten filament inside the incandescent bulb. So they're 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 uh, glowing for different reasons. So let's compare the two: a fluorescent light and incandescent light. One's hot, one's not. You know, so everything that glows isn't necessarily hot. Yeah, hot things do glow. But not everything that glows is hot. You know, fireflies is a perfect example. There's there's a, a process going on there. See, same with fluorescent light bulb. So you see this thing that looks like a fire. Well, it, uh, any other day you you just assume it's a fire. But because we're being real careful, you know, like making sure we can find the the got, you know, fingerprints of the guy on the on the gun. Uh, you, you look at it and you went, wait a minute, the plastic isn't burning. You got this police car. It's just all toasted inside. But the lights on top, they're polycarbonate that, you know, start melting at like 100 degrees. They're not melted. How's that? It's a different... You've got images of these on your website, aren't you? Yep. It, it's even on the uh, the AHA page. You can, okay. you can find that. Um, I'll post a few of those in. Yeah, that's... Uh, let's see. If, J is Toasted Cars. If you go there, uh, p- uh, figure 56... You see the plastic uh, lights on top of the police car, and you see there's nothing left inside that car. It's just, just totally toast. And he says, "Yeah, some you know rusted fried metal, but and on the but the back tire is nice, and uh, you know the, the the paint job in the back end is nice. Looks like it came off showroom floor. The, the trunk lid's open. Makes you wonder, you know, 57. It, yeah, 56. You can see the lights." Yeah, we, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm going to put 57 in because it's got that shiny circle as well. Oh, oh, but let's do 56 first. Okay. Because 56, you see, look on the roof. If you had, you know, if this is an oven inside and you're you're just having some rip roaring fire in there, why are those plastic lights still intact? You know, some on the other side are, are toasted, but the ones right above the the passenger side in the front seat, you know, right above the roof there, they're not melted. Absolutely. And then now let's go to the other picture, uh, 57. Yep. 
Yeah, you know, let me first say something. You know, the the uh, detractors like to say, oh, it was towed, so there doesn't matter what happened to it. There's some cars on FDR Drive that were not towed there that were toasted, and we have eyewitnesses to them. I I don't say a car got toasted where where I, the photograph was taken unless I know that. But uh, you know. The day after 9-11, are, are they playing musical cars all over Manhattan? You know, and, and why are people focused on that? We have you know, pictures of at least you know several hundred cars while they're toasting where they are. There's the toasted car park and then also up and down West Broadway. Uh, other ones we're not sure of, but the, these ones, I don't know where they're toasted, but look at what the weirdness is here. Yeah, so you see that, that circular spot. Um, fires, when they burn, you have black, white, shades of gray. You know, totally burned, not burned at all with a transition zone in between. You don't have something that's totally toasted and one nanometer over, it's pristine. How do you have that circular spot there? You know, toasted, not toasted. It's just, it's you know, taking the, taking the evidence. But look at the nice tire back there. And it looks like they have, you know, the fill cap for the gas tank is back there. Uh, it didn't explode, but you have this nice tire there, fully inflated. And uh, what about the tire on the front end? Uh, you know, you get nothing there. Just you just have the rim. No, 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 uh, no. As if they're about to it's just gone. And there's other ones where the window frame is just flopped out. It isn't this one, but some other ones that are weird like that. So um, it's just you see a pattern, and it isn't necessarily. Uh, you know, it's people can say, "Well, I've seen burnt cars." There's there's a difference. If you look at that other picture. Uh, which was it, uh, 56? Yep. Um, look at that picture and look at where the front windshield sits, the, the seating for the front windshield. You don't have a single scrap of glass left, not even the seal. It, it's as though, uh, you know, somebody sandblasted for a paint job. It's really, it's, you know, other ones that are more clean looking than this, but you don't have any scraps of glass there. That's weird. Yep. There's burnt plenty of cars with completely completely clean, completely clean yeah. of the glass. Yep, uh, burnt cars, you know, from car fire. They generally have, uh, you know, pieces of something left in the corners. But this is it's just like uh, somebody something that removed all of the glass in the windshield. Right. Of the side window. I want you to you just go through the. Um the justification, not the justification, sorry. Um, the, uh, well, oh, oh, the hang on, one more, one more car, uh, uh, figure 59. That one 59. really looks like, looks like it's been uh, spray painted, I mean, uh, sandblasted for a new paint job. That seating for the, you know, there's no, not even any dings in this one. Look, there's and nothing got, left. You and see it's it? got clean windows as well. Yeah, I'm posting it into the chat room now. These windows yeah, are completely the, clean. The Swamp Toast picture. Yep. Yep. Um, and and that's from I call it the swamp. Uh, that's you can see why. It's uh, uh, one block north of where Building Seven had been. That's West Broadway. For like four blocks, every car is toasted in some manner or other all along there. Not completely toasted necessarily, but look at the car right behind this one. You know what happened to the engine compartment? We don't know, but it, it looks like something happened to it. And you get that toasted bus, but look above the toasted bus. Green leafy trees. If you have some rip roaring fire there, why isn't it, you know, burning the trees? Absolutely. These are subtle things, but we see the the trick is don't jump to an answer. Just take in the data, and the data will tell you what happened. Don't tell the data what it's supposed to show you. You look at what it's telling you. I thought to completely shift gears for a minute and just talk about. It, um, the thermite um, and the the numerous names and the dates that have come out with these names because to keep this, like you, when uh, you do, presented do, your information. Do you, do you have that list? Do you have that list that I, I gave that link to the page? I know you did. But I don't wait. I can't find it. So um, I hoping you could just point me at it again. Uh, let's see. It's it's if you go to um, my website, then you go to the critics corner. Okay. And then, uh, or from the hot page, you can open critics corner. Whoops. I put it. Uh, and then from there you'll see um, uh, scientific or something. I think it's there. Let's see. I'm, I'm, I probably got I'm a little bit slower. Uh, let's see. Oh, history. Here, here it is. History repeats true science versus the official truth movement. Okay. 
I think it's that one. Yep, that's the one it is. It's near the top of that list. Oh, sure has got it. Yeah, you got it. Okay, I, I'll put yeah. in a uh, window just to. Right. So, when you've presented your evidence, have you ever changed your evidence? No, I, I start out general, like, okay, people, you know, give me a hard time about the Greg Jenkins thing. I don't see anything in there that I need to retract. Okay. You know, I was just starting to point out but, the evidence. They said, what kind of energy? What kind of energy? Oh, no, we haven't gotten there yet. You know, we're so just in December the 2005, I'm oh, sorry, in no, December no, 2005, they called it thermite. Thermite. Yep. I'll let you carry on. Oh, you, you go and ahead. Like go ahead. And it went March 2006. Liquid aluminium has a property that is silvery, rather like aluminium foil. You know, at all temperatures in daylight conditions. Right in 2006, it's thermite that can be purchased on eBay. In July 2006, it's super thermite. In August 2006, it's thermate. In January 2007, it's thermite, thermate plus something else. In June 2007, it's spray on thermite. In July 2007, it was thermite and couldn't be because it was missing some ingredients. So yeah, it, it, was was, yeah, it was thermite. Yeah, it was thermite, yeah. Because it was missing, so they call it thermite analog. Yep. Yeah. In 2008, it was nano enhanced thermite. In 2009, it was nano thermite. Um, we can then, all agree that nanothermite yeah, was used. Yeah. And then in 2009, it became nanothermite, nanothermitic material. So, the, the truth movement. Yeah, it came, uh, became nanothermitic material that they found because they didn't find thermite. Yeah. Uh, you know what the nanothermitic material is? Remember how, with my chocolate chip cookie story, you know, the buildings turn to dust. It, most of them turn to dust, so therefore you can find every consistent of the building in there. The building was made out of steel with aluminum cladding, the main you know, structural element. Uh, steel is, uh, the majority of it's iron. That with, you know, other doodads in it like chromium and, and, uh, things like that. So, so if you turn that to dust, if you take all the atoms apart, uh, you know, the, yeah. it, what are you gonna have? You're gonna have very small pieces of, of, uh, iron that in atmospheric conditions are gonna instantly rust. You're gonna have a whole bunch of rust, a whole bunch of iron oxide. And then the aluminum cladding turns to dust, you have aluminum powder and iron oxide. Those are ingredients of thermite. So you have thermitic material. It's small, so you have nanothermitic material. That's not nanothermite. I do not disagree with their finding. Remember, they're getting you to assume the wrong problem. I don't agree. Yep. I, I don't disagree with their quote, uh, you know, Bentham paper, they, they call it peer review, um, that nanothermitic material was found there. Yeah, aluminum powder and iron oxide. Yeah, I agree. That was in the dust. If it wasn't, we'd have something more seriously wrong here. Because we saw the building turn to dust. So if you so don't find you the parts of the building in there... When did you first come out with your evidence? Well, I, from the beginning, but I wasn't being so loud about it. I, you know, on day one, uh, you know, I was looking in the faculty conference room, like, don't you guys see what I'm seeing? And they looked at me like I was crazy. This when was, isn't when a was class. the first time you found someone who, who was actually looking at well, you like you wasn't crazy? It's, uh, well, I didn't, uh, you know, you, you start talking about it, and people look like you're crazy, so, you, you know, you, you kind of talk about people here and there, but, but I thought the grown ups were going to take care of it. You know, I've, I've got my job to do. They have their job to do. Meaning like NIST or whatever. But it became clear that the grown-ups weren't going to take care of it. And somebody needed to. And if I wasn't going to do it, who else was? And, and still to this day, who else is there? And I, and I, and I, and I couldn't have done it without, uh, you know, others around me helping like, you know, Andrew Johnson, Morgan Reynolds, Jerry Leapart, Russ Gerst. Those, it, you know, but there's just a small handful of us. But if this hadn't been done, it, it still wouldn't, you know, and people would say, well, it's official story of thermite, official story of thermite. They'd give you a false choice to funnel you into that and you never could solve it that way. Um, yes. but, but, uh, in 2005, I, think my I went to, in there. Yeah, yeah. Very briefly, you mentioned those names and I, something came to mind when you mentioned the names. We're not a movement. We've never, I don't think we've ever all met together in the same place at the same time. No. Nope. I don't think we've ever had a conference call, um, you know, to work out a plan or anything like that. We've each done 
whatever it is we felt needed to be done or you know we've asked for help in doing something at a certain time in a certain way you know we haven't gone out and, and sought to you know set up a website and then put on a you know all these questions and I think yeah, and all these you know all these these other sort of uh, criticisms of other people but what what I think um, I was going to say at that point as well is if, if people who have listened to architects and engineers nonsense and it is nonsense really you, you can go and look at that critique if you've been listening to this this broadcast this podcast you can now go back through it or having listened to it go and look at their critique of Dr. Judy Wood's uh, website and book and everything and see I like people for themselves just in their own way they don't have to write to us unless they really want to just look at their critique the, the architects and engineers one and see if they think it covers all the evidence that's been covered in this two and a half hours that this has been laid out in fact it's almost three now I think you think you see if that criticism covers that evidence for yourself you know and I think you'll be able to work out from that if you've got truly a, an open mind and you've been listening to more than half of this, you should be able to oh. get get a handle on what what those sorts of critiques do. And it, and that includes, in fact, most of the the critiques that have been put out there. You know, the Greg Jenkins one that we've mentioned briefly that comes up, and there are probably two or three others that uh, get get thrown around fairly fairly regularly. So yeah, just just look at those things and consider what you've heard and see if the two marry up or you know and who's basically should be able to work out who's telling the truth and who isn't. Quite, quite well, when were these groups formed? Oh, various times. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, they, they the, serve various usefulnesses. Uh, hmm. you know, and then what you know the, the 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 planned demolition of the of them too. You know, hmm. Be- because if okay, when I first started. You know, energetically posting the evidence on my website, suddenly there's all this banging pots and pans noise over here. Oh, don't look there, look over here. And there's this, uh, it, I, uh, Morgan Reynolds and I resigned from Fetzer's group in, um, or Fetz, the Fetzer Jones group, which was, they were, they were co, uh, leaders or whatever. They, you know, it wasn't, Fetzer didn't organize, they bring about the group. Dave Ray Griffin, I understand, uh, put these two guys together to, to do this group. And they were co-chairman uh, or something. I don't know what their titles was. But I, I, Morgan Reynolds and I resigned in August 17th, 2006. Then, hey, now we're free to do some real damage. You know, you know nobody, nobody answered except but us. And uh, that's when I put up the, that first big long series. And we put out this uh, article, you know, critique of, of Jones's work. Like, you know, Jones doesn't talk about this. He doesn't talk about that. He doesn't talk. Well, let's go talk about it. You know, just we didn't just criticize Jones. We said he doesn't talk about this, and then we went and talked about it, and started working on it. And uh, as soon as that came out, that was creating too much attention, so that uh, you know, Fetzer and Jones had this this fake divorce and throwing you know spit fight. So, so people were looking at the spit fight instead of at my website. And that's Judy Wood's fault for for destroying the truth movement because she put up this website. Well, I wasn't a member of his club, so what does it matter what I'm doing? And mm-hmm. and so it, that was uh, very effective that way. And that's also when uh, uh, Stephen Jones came up with talk, you know, saying I talk about rabies from outer space and uh, space bee names and things like that that I've never talked about. Uh, I, I, if anything, I say, well, we can rule out laser beams from space because thermal energy was not the destructive mechanism. And a laser beam from space would be cooking the buildings. So it's, it, it's, you know, it rules that out. But it is interesting, and here's uh, more evidence of uh, what how effective that tactic was about banging pots and pans over here so you don't look at, at Dr. Wood's website. Um, in uh, February, beginning of February 2010, there's this big grand release of, uh, oh, this Freedom of Information request from ABC News and, and never before seen pictures. Look at these pictures. Wow. Those were all the pictures that were on my website. People didn't realize they'd seen them for the past X number of years because they were deterred from looking at my website. And so they weren't never before seen pictures. And, uh, I've got pretty good evidence of this because I submitted them in my, my federal KTAM case in 2007. 
Also, the images on my website don't have the, uh, the, the copyright whatever stamp that, that they put on those other ones that were on the ABC News. I have the raw images. I would spend hours and hours going around the internet looking for images. And I, I if I find a batch, I download them and I, I note where I got them from. And I downloaded that batch. And I have them. And I put them on my website so other people could see them. And so, uh, uh, then there's this, uh, wonderful person, a lawyer, who, uh, saw what I had on my website and went, whoa, that's evidence that can go to court. And um, he figured out this. Maybe Andrew can knows more of the details of this, but he figured out this, this brilliant way of you know of, of this approach that in order to find file a federal QTAM case, you have to be a whistleblower. And in my way, we being whistleblower was to file or submit a uh, request for corrections to NIST, letting them know that their uh, contractors messed up and they're committing fraud. So I notified a government agency of this fraud. I, I submitted that the 16th of March, 2007. And then that qualified me to file a federal key tam case, a whistleblower case, because there, now I had, it qualified as a whistleblower. You have to be the first one to do it, and you have to, to, uh, uh, show that there's fraud. Those are the, the basic things. And, uh, the courts were, had started misinterpreting it, said, well, you have to prove premeditation, you have to prove um, that the, they, they had premeditation where they were standing and where the, the hour hand was, the clock, and the minute hand, the second hand, and you know, and, and the nanosecond hand, it, it, to, to the point that nobody could ever win a case. And uh, then Congress said, no, 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 that's not what we meant of this law. This is what we meant. You have to, in order for the case to go forward, you have to show this fraud, and you have to be the first one to blow the whistle on it. And uh, they had restated that. This is right after the. Um, uh, the, what would they call that in 2008 where, uh, the Enron thing and, and the, nobody wanted to see where the money was going, you know, and they wanted to have, uh, uh some accountability. Is this big payout that went, uh, to the banks to, to hold them afloat or something like that. And so, uh, they, the, Congress, uh, restated their intention of that original law. It's not a new law, they restated, they call it the Fraud Enforcement Recovery Act. And that applied to my case. Uh, and so there's no way they could, they could throw out the case saying that it was, uh, I need to show what, where the second hand was on the clock and, and, uh, whose cousin's uncle's brother did whatever and had what for breakfast. No, I just had to show that there was fraud and that I'm the first one to blow the whistle about this. Well, I had, uh, for my request for corrections to NIST, they admitted fraud in that letter. They, they, they said, oh, we didn't, uh, we didn't analyze the collapse. That's fraud. So in your court case, there were no mention of any directed energy weapons, there were no mention of justification, right. it, there were no mention of toasted cars, it was just, uh, you are lying, sort it out. Yeah, here's why you're lying. Here's an example. Underwriters Lab was paid by our tax dollars, so you can you can't sue a government agency, but you can uh, you can sue the um, the contractors who right. are paid out of ta- tax dollars. So here we had the Underwriters Lab was paid to make uh, two half scale mock-ups of a floor span and then a full two full scale mock-ups. All right, they they are cooking them. Uh, you know, twice the temperature Fahrenheit for twice as long, and they still weren't failing to support load. So they had to call the test. Four out of four times, it, it, they could not get to, it to fail to support the load. Yet they signed off on a report saying the fire did it. That is fraud. And I, you know, right. Don and Andrew helped, you know, also uh, come up with, you know, these various issues. And each one of the contractors, there's a, a set of things. As well as conflict of interest, Applied Research Associates, uh, they're directors and manufacturers of energy weapons, and I showed evidence of that. I even sent that to, to NIST, and NIST said, oh, we didn't know that. Oh, bingo. I, I've got verification that uh, I was the first to notify them. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so they know what they're looking at. Not only that, they have a, a grant with the uh, U.S. government to know everything about any weapon of mass destruction that exists or is being developed anywhere. So not only do they know what technology is, they know whose technology it is. And I wanted to see them put under oath. So, uh, you know, here, they were, had the most number of, of, uh, 
uh, what do you call it, employees on that contract. Of any, of the, the next second highest was SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation, which also uh, delves into energy weapons, and they were also in charge of security at the site. I think beginning the, the next day, you know, they're they're the ones in charge of uh, that gate opening where the the, the dirt truck pulled out. <laughs> uh, they could tell you where the dirt was going, um, and we wanted to get them under oath too. So there's a long list of these, you know. Things we had to you know, issues. There's plenty of issues going on, and clearly there was fraud. And uh, the uh, the lower court judge dismissed it because, well, uh, he wasn't going to hear a case about who shot JFK or what landed on the moon, uh, and amongst other things, just a whole bunch of nonsense stuff. Uh, it, you know, sir, uh, maybe he didn't read the read the uh, the case. Maybe take a look. Well, he, he uh, you know didn't want to look at it, so it was appealed to the um, Court of Appeals, and that's when that Fraud Enforcement Recovery Act was in effect that said you couldn't use this other garbage to dismiss a case. So these judges, in their written decision, wrote, we're going to ignore this new Fraud Enforcement Recovery Act and then just dismiss the case. So they're ignoring the law to dismiss the case. Right. And they said it openly because there's only like five or six people on the planet that we're aware of it outside of that that really would care you know Andrew me uh, uh, lawyer Russ Gerst Morgan Reynolds you know there's a small group of us and we couldn't advertise well, if you're involved in a case you can't fight it in the court of public opinion but we can't help if other people do trouble is uh, that was shut down the truth movement anyone who talked about it was was uh, booted out of um, 8911 truth so 8 I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, what happened with the UK uh, forum? I tried to advertise the case on our UK 9/11 Truth forum, and we had a, a news, you know, a news uh, segment or a news section, I should say. And I put uh, a link to a press release that I wrote about the court case, and I sent that elsewhere as well. I sent it to, you know, BBC and various other places. That was in uh, uh, late 2007, and. Um, uh, the uh, the UK 9/11 Truth Forum. They Tony Gosling, who ran that forum, moved my post from a news section into a controversies section, as if it was like some controversial thing, you know. When it wasn't, all the documentation had been laid out, and uh, the uh, you know that court case had been in preparation since 2006. Um, and so it had yeah. been well, well prepared. Um, you know, and it was, and, uh, you know, I was, that was my first priority. That's why my web, my website was just a file cabinet storing stuff while I was working yeah. on it. And then after that, I worked on the book. Cause I wasn't going to do the book first. I want, you know, getting that court case yeah. out there yeah. before it got too yeah. long. And if people look at when the domain name for AE911 was created, I don't know the exact date, but the... It was the end of October 2006, which was after I put up my, quote, Star Wars Beam Weapons article. You know, after Borg and I put up that other thing. But the first time their website was archived was three and a half weeks after I submitted my request for corrections to NIST. And it was about... That's when they submitted their their thermite-free RFC. Yes. Yes, so that was... was, So you, you can see that this is more... The damage uh, control in the pots and pans, you know, which would happen to just so happened to be around the same time as the, those filings were made and all the other research was being posted. Actually, so the day that I submitted my RFC to NIST, request for correction to NIST in mid uh, March, Andrew prepared a press uh, a press release. It went out there and it started, you know, zipping around. And that was same day. Stephen Jones came up. Oh, I just got these these this whistleblower uh, blueprints for the building. Now we can do something. Look, I get, you know, it just make all this noise out of it, banging pots and pans. Mm-hmm. It was just floor plans. Yeah. And, uh, it, yeah. So, uh, have you got the letter for the um, architects and engineers? Oh, that was the. Uh, oh, that that thing that you're talking about. Um, the, um, the, the the rules for for joining. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. yeah the, you mean the vetting procedures? 
The vetting procedure, if you want to become a member of Architects and Engineers for Truth, um, there's a vetting yeah, procedure. Yeah, I, I could probably dig that out. I've got that somewhere. Well, I, I said it, I gave it to him uh, yesterday. You gave me it to do, yeah. Oh. I thought you could just send me the link so I could just read off the, the I, requirements. I don't, I, for. I don't know where it is online, but... Um, well, I, I can probably find it, but basically, yeah, I mean, just to summarise it, we'll, we'll post the link in the chat window, but if you look at the, the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth vetting procedures, that was leaked by somebody who... Um, who realised that um, you know the architects and engineers group wasn't really going any, anywhere, and so they wrote this book called Nano Management: The Destruction of a Truth Group or something. I can't remember the exact title. After we get this in a minute, um, let's just see if this was uh, Nano Management: The Disintegration of a Non-Profit Corporation. And I've got. I've this got. I've got, it. I've got it. Yeah, I've got it here. Some um, my through a mic three. For the there it is. Through a mic three blog. But I'll, I'll put it in the I, chat. I have window. it. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I just yeah. gave it to you guys. Yeah, okay. I've, I've got a link to it though. It's not a file. Oh, it's a link. So okay. If you, if you, that 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 came from this book, which was called um, yeah, Nano Management. Management, and it was oh, it was, was was available as a free PDF. I'll get the exact title again. It was. Um, <laughs> Anatomy, yes, uh, sorry, nano management: the disintegration of a non-profit uh, corporation (SC) by Michael Arm Armenia. And within that book was this page. Let's see if it's still on Lulu. People. That's can, uh, uh, two page two seventy three or something like that. That's yeah, pretty far down there. Yeah, I've, I've pasted the link in the chat window. On the, okay. on the, uh, uh, yeah. If you just want to read from a, if you want to read the thing, you just read this page. This page, just read it out because this page is absolute dynamite. Yeah, yeah, so um, we'll ju I'll just I'll just get that, that back up again. And, and so w when people sign up for eight nine eleven truth, they uh, you know they get put on a team that to, to keep them busy to do something. And That's fine. and so and so uh, one of the teams are the vetting teams to see if somebody's uh, qualified to to join their their club. And and this is tells you know you reject you, they they apparently do background checks on people and check to see you know, lots of web searches with the right. applicant's name it's, with and, and anything else. This is Appendix C from the a, a architects and engineers uh, vetting procedures, and it says the primary source for information is the internet. Brackets if necessary, contacted personal references may be considered. Therefore, it is assumed that the vetter is competent in using the internet for research, particularly with regard to using search engines and their respective advanced search criteria. A, I won't read all of that because it goes on a bit. Um, and then it says, use a general search, cross-reference search results to confirm identity, attempt to find at least one photograph. Google a uh, complete email address, username at domain.xyz, Google the username, Google phone number, 9-11 related to site search. search search the JREF forum search 9-11 blogger search 9-11 meetup it says uh, refine searches well, using google.com if not already just, found for items they believe to get above Recite, refine google searches to determine any correlation to questionable ideologies using combinations of username and a search term as well as full name and a, new, and a search term among the search terms to be considered are brackets, no planes, sorry, quotation marks, no planes, DEW, as in DEW, nukes, HARP, UFO, Judy Wood, Jews, Holocaust, and Zionism. So, the only, if you look at this page, the only person named, the only person named in the whole of human history is, uh, funnily enough, Judy Wood. So isn't that strange? So anyone that found Judy Wood connected with any websites that, or whatever that this person that they were vetting was associated with should be considered for non-admission. Non and, and, we, and we've documented uh, four cases of this, three or four cases where AE911 members who had signed their petition and set up a profile had put some information or links about Judy Wood's research. Like Building 4 uh, is another one, yeah. Right, and they'd either had uh, their uh, pay, their profile deleted completely, or they'd had the their profile edited to take out links or references to Dr. Judy Wood. So we have proof 
that that organisation was actively filtering out information about what you've been t- hearing over the last few hours. And, uh, and, and uh, also, yet they, yet they claim to be a, a 9/11 Truth organisation. I mean, we, we could do a whole program about a 9/11. I mean, that that much is clear. They're not good. They are up to no good. Their entire mission statement is to su- suppress the truth. That is, they're Correct. not after the truth. They've got too much Correct. money, too much influence, too much power. If they'd have got behind um, Dr. Judy Wood's court case, um, which wasn't about anything other than saying the government has lied, let's have well, an investigation. Well, that, no, no, that, no, 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 not just the government lied. It was, it was about the, the contractors on the news report because that's we had a Sorry. legal avenue because they defrauded. The, the the American taxpayers they were paid yeah, for by taxpayer money and if they'd have they, got behind you they would have got what right, they wanted right, let, me, right. let, me, let me emphasize this more so I was showing where they had committed fraud it was a case about fraud and you know who these people were many members of the military industrial complex and none of them with their bank of lawyers could find anything wrong with the information I submitted that's why they had to ignore the law to dismiss the case yeah, and put up a mass propaganda against anything you were doing. So now, if you had if if you had a hundred thousand people on the street, yeah, yeah, right. had, if the street outside that court, they gave us an eight minute you know hearing, uh, and if you had the street filled with um, you know truthers demanding this case go forward, they would have had a hard hard time to sweep it on the carpet. But as it was, can you sort of blame them? Because I guarantee you, I think it, no, I don't guarantee you, but. I think it's a good chance 99.999%. If that case was sent forward, those lawyers would probably be justified on the way home from work. I and then yeah, it, it doesn't go anywhere. The, the other thing that gets covered up in all of this, while we're getting onto these issues a little bit, is that it's the government this, the government that, the government lied, or the government, mm-hmm. you know, set up this story or whatever it, Who's the whatever they say. But what was involved in the in the court case, and this is extremely important that people realise this, was action against private contractors uh, that the government had employed. So it may well be we could argue that the government was was you know it's not quite true we know that but the government was being. Uh, in fact, it, 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 from you could even go as far as saying that they were they knew that the contractors weren't being totally honest. But, but that's what they wanted. They, yeah, oh yeah, that, that's yeah. what I brought up to NIST, and NIST said, "Oh, but it was specifically in the contract of ARA that they were not to tell us what happened." Yeah, yeah. So we we got even more information from that. So you know there is there is some evidence that they were obviously uh, working to the same goals, but. We got well. You could also read it that certain people in the government weren't very happy about what was being done, and they were actually trying to, in a very sort of uh, cryptic way, tell 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 us that they knew. You know, these these contractors had to be. They had the most power basically, and they were allowed to lie and to, and they you know and carry out their agenda, which was to keep the technology. Which is what this is all about, covered up, uh, and, th- and that that technology hasn't been developed by the government itself. It may have been developed by a consortium of contractors uh, in black, black budget programs, but the, you know we don't we don't n- we don't know the details of th- we don't know all the serial numbers of the technology and all that sort of stuff. I've, I've got a I've got a beautiful example, a parallel. See, it, you know, if, if uh, we had enough people who cared about this case. It could have gone forward. Mm-hmm. It had a lot, a lot better chance to go forward than if only five people know about it. Five people know about it. Uh, they, why would j- judges stick their necks out? Uh, but there's another ca- uh, similar whistleblower case, well, parallel, but similar, wh- parallel case where the same whistleblower case uh, uh, law was used. And that'll blow you away. Uh, Lance Armstrong, who was doping in winning seven Tour de France's. And then he retired, and the next year Floyd Landis won, and he got caught for doping. I think maybe Lance Armstrong uh, you know, saw they're developing a test to be able to test this stuff, but they knew he would he'd been had having positive tests along the way, but uh, made you know donations to make the test go away, or you know, in other words, a lot of people knew that Lance Armstrong was was doping, but they but they helped cover it up the whole way through. Uh, David Walsh from 
London, I forgot what newspaper he was with, was was on his trail from the get-go, and Lance Armstrong sued the newspaper. And and they, they settled out of court and they had to pay it off, but the newspaper was correct. They could stand behind it. Now, Greg Lamond, who won the Tour de France three times, he had a bike company, Lamond Bikes, uh, and he said uh, about Lance Armstrong, you know, winning like he did, he said, well, it's either the best, co- the, the the biggest comeback in the history of all sports, or the guy's cheating. That's a true statement. It's one or the other. He wasn't accusing him of cheating. He was saying it's the greatest comeback in the history of all sports, or he's cheating. And because I hear a keyboard, <laughs> uh, can somebody mute their keyboard? Hello. Oh, Andrew, Andrew, could you mute your mute keyboard? Um, anyway, uh, so in the history of all sports, you know, or, or, or he's cheating. Well, based on that one statement, uh, Greg LeMond's bike company was destroyed by, by Lance Armstrong. He had that kind of power. But then finally it became fashionable to file this, this case. And um, that, that uh, you know, that, that it was able to come out. Only, you know what, 13 years? And then it was fashionable. And you know what? Lay, Floyd Landis filed a federal key temp case, just like mine. Because Lance Armstrong was paid by the U.S. Postal System. He was a contractor for the government. He was a private contractor. He was paid he's and new. he committed fraud. This is, he's new. It's only his second show. Hello? What? Hello? And and uh, so so uh, you know Lance Armstrong committed fraud, and it was the same law that was used, and that that moved forward because it was fashionable. So, so, but, my point is that um, if we, we had a chance, the, the 911 Truth Movement had a chance to get what they are asking for, and because of their lack of publicity and the lack of the cover up, Be- because they the, get conned. Because I got conned by the charlatans that claim to be out for truth, your A and E groups and your the groups that are just distractions away from what you, we, we should be looking at. Um, they were they were talked into trashing my work and not looking at it, so they didn't, they wouldn't see the that's evidence. Right. They're taught into just believing the story and standing behind their you know, waving their flag for their football team instead of thinking. And yeah, if they had gotten behind this. It would have moved forward. Now, I, I want to bring out one more thing. Take this opportunity to put this out publicly, because the people who've been around this for so long will now go aha, and a lot, well, light bulbs will kick on. Uh, so I couldn't talk about this case as long as it was a live case. But as soon as it was, it was denied, not dismissed, but it was denied. The Supreme Court doesn't have to hear a case unless they feel like it. Well, they didn't feel like it, and so they denied the case. That ended the case. You know what happened right after that? Richard Gage, Stephen Jones, Dave Ray Griffin, and so forth, organized this uh, nationwide press conference. Every city, people were supposed to rent a room at a hotel in case the press had any questions. Now, now that I was free to talk about it, no way I could get any word out. They had a lockdown. In addition, remember, ABC never released pictures before. They Those popped out then, so I didn't have the shock and awe. So this was the, those are the pictures in my case. Wasn't it an interesting coincidence of timing? And, and I've talked to somebody recently um, who's, who was, you know, involved, and they said, yeah, they always wonder what that weird thing was about this press conference in every city. And people were supposed to rent a room at a hotel, you know, in case the press wanted to talk to them. Now, you know, anyone who's hearing this, now that you know why. Have the, have the architect and engineers group, well, I'm sure they have, um, have they threatened you ever, openly? Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't exist. But see, I, I've been busy trying to solve the, the problem, not looking to the left and looking to the right. If you want unity, look for the truth. The truth is singular and the truth is unifying. If you're looking to the left and to the right and who to poke and stab and undermine, it, you're not looking at the truth. If everybody's looking at nope. the truth, trying to figure out what happened, then they're moving forward. And so that's what I have chosen to do. I'm talking, I'm talking about the Fetzer incident where you were on the, live, on the oh, phone call, yeah. you said well, that, you threatened me. <laughs> well, th- right. That was, uh, uh, is, this is when I first uh, made the connection with John Hutchison. 
Thou shalt not make such connections. Uh, he wrote a letter to me, or an email to me, telling me that I need to, he couldn't say, if I didn't stop talking about Hutchison, he couldn't save me for what was going to happen to me. And I took that to mean a death threat. But Andrew took it to mean he was going to destroy my reputation. It turns out Andrew was right. And that's what he's done ever since. He's spread all sorts of rumors, you know. Judy would attack this person, attacks that person. She talks about space beams. She did. And there's even recent stuff that uh, saying that I was doing bomb threats. But see, he gets out of it legally by saying so and so believes that Judy's the one doing bomb fr- threats. So yeah. you, you know you can't. You can't uh, but but it, it's forming the lie in somebody's mind. I like what Andrew reminded us all of. We're out to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Not misleading stories. That's a misleading yep. story to say, oh, you know, Don Fox believes that Judy would, you know, threaten or put out these bombs. You know, that's not evidence. That's just somebody believes we, this. And I, I came up with the uh, court oath for trolls, as, as we call them. And, <laughs> and, and the judge would uh, say to them, uh, or the clerk of the court, or whoever would say, do you swear to, some, to tell some truth, some half truth, or anything but the truth? And, and that's the, the oath that you would give somebody like Jim Fetzer or Stephen E. Jones in court, and then of course they would be able to say what they liked, which is what yeah, they do. Yeah, and and you know it's a it's a federal crime to defraud the government. So uh, now ask yourself why you know the the uh, thing the that eighty nine eleven truth submitted to NIST did not contain any evidence of thermite or molten metal or you know they left that out of that. That's the, the, the whole platform. That's the that's, that's, that's their entire case r- is formed it, on it's, this. It's it's uh if they submitted that, they're defrauding the U.S. government, and that's a federal crime. It used to be even worse. Right. It used to be called it, to consider treason with the uh, Smith Munt Act, uh, which they it undid in in uh, the year 2012. But um, it, that's changed. But it was in effect at the time that that submission was made. So um, you have to ask who's interested in the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you know, it isn't it isn't a thing about infighting. Infighting means you're you're on the same you know have the same objective. If truth is your objective, that's not a problem. But um, it, that's another uh, card that gets played. Oh, we got to all agree with the same thing so we can have unity. Well, then why is AE 9-11 Truth infighting with NIST? Why are they infighting with the official 9-11 story? It's, it's, um, it's, it's all about management. I mean, yep, it, you showed it's me... Yep, it's perception the, management. Yeah, you showed me Jim Fetz has um, he's even reviewed your book, so he's read your book. So, or he's got a copy of your book. Whether he's read it or not, I don't know. But he's, he's certainly aware of your book. And it, it's, it's all about trying to manage the people's perception of your work to either discredit it or stop people even willing to even entertain it as an idea I, I love what uh, Professor Eric Larson had said uh, You know, it, sentences he uses are sneaky sentences and the words are sneaky helpers in the sentence and you start yeah. looking at it and it's got all of this this underhanded undermining like well she, you know she's off to a good start you know this but she has some you know problems like for example, he claims I don't talk about tritium. Well, he's edited it and changed it. Well, she, she minimizes it. And then, well, she doesn't talk about strontium, barium, and so forth. Uh, didn't he pay attention to his the conference he organized in 2007? Yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> you know, I've been covering that. Um, but it's perception. He doesn't have to tell the truth. But he, he actually doesn't exactly explicitly lie. It's a half-truth that causes, just like a magician, it causes the person the audience to think he said something else. Oh yeah, I'm going to read the um, Urban Dictionary quote about Fetzerin. <laughs> I absolutely love this. Um, so I'm just pulling it up now. Fetzerin, go, search. Where's it gone? There it goes. Fetzering, noun, the act of making an unfounded or substantiated claim. Number two, in philosophy, a method of debate or discussion based on the premise of I think, therefore I am. I think you're wrong, therefore you are. Number three, the act of disagreeing by employing rancor name calling, ad hornyman attacks or strawman arguments. 
Etymology. Fetzerin began in earnest in the late 1960s, be being implemented by JFK conspiracy theorists and has since expanded its use into the 9-11 debate. Number one, without evidence, your claim is simply Fetzerin. Number two, he should rely on his data instead of Fetzerin. Absolute. Sums it up. Yeah. Sums it up. But it, it, it's so the ones that the, who are good at it don't explicitly lie. They just yep. tell misleading truths and they leave the lies up to the, the perception of the, you know, the assumption of the audience. Like a magician doesn't lie. That's why it wouldn't work very well if the magician lied to the people. He just causes them to make the wrong conclusion and to try to be solving the wrong problem. Creating something by, by, you know, half truth, half truths are lies. You can, you can, you can create, I've done magic that I've never ever done. Like, if I'm at, if I'm in a pub or a bar or a restaurant and someone says, oh, you're a magician, fill my glass of wine. And I can say, right, well, I'm a magician and I can't fill a glass of wine. What's going on there? So I would say something like this. I'd say, ah, well, I once, um, I once did that. Um, very thing and then I went out for a cigarette and then um, when I were out there the, the waitress I, I walked back in and the waitress were getting a massive scorn from the uh, the owner of the restaurant and I walked over and said what's happening and he said that guy over there has got a full drink and he hadn't paid for it and this waitress has must have given me and I said oh no that, no, that was me so I don't do that magic trick anymore now they go out and say that magician he can fill glasses full of wine right I've just told a story that is so convincing in their mind that um, they believe it to be true and it's not true. So they, they spread a rumor around that I can make uh, alcoholic drinks on request. You want lager? There it is. You want wine? There it is. And I convince them with the story that I've told that I've already done this and got a girl in trouble, so I'll never do it again. They tell the story that I've done it. I've done magic that I've never done. And it gets spread around that I can do it. And it, I've, I've, I've done this. This is bizarre. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, magicians can actually do magic without doing magic. It's like... Um, David Icke, he says, um, problem, reaction, solution. He's also got the no problem, reaction, solution. And that's very similar. That's like not doing a magic trick, but getting everyone to believe you have. Not even yeah. doing one, just talking about it. Yeah, exactly. And now, it, if I may interject with that, that people talk about bombs in the building, oh, and the suddenly I noticed posted, posted on your Facebook uh, thread, and they said, um, oh, couldn't it be both? In other words, oh, yeah, we, we now agree you know, we've looked at Dr. Wood's evidence and we now agree that, yeah, pretty sure that something like directed energy weapons were used. But, couldn't it have been bombs and, and or thermite and or nukes as well? You know... Not quite wanting to and, let go of the, the belief. Yeah, and I, I answer that, my answer to that is, well, if you think about it, the stories of bombs and nukes and so on have been just as good as actually putting bombs in the building that's, you know, really doing it, if you see what I mean. That so yeah. many people have been sucked into it, just like you were saying with your glass filling, the, you know, filling the wine glass story. You never actually did that. You just were never. able to weave, weave a story, you know, in the right circumstances, and people believed it. And it's exactly the same with the bombs in the building at the World Trade Center. It's exact, I, well, I think it's exactly the same. I mean, it yeah. was sort of backed up a little bit by these exploding tanks, which we've got witness accounts of outside the building, if not inside as well. Absolutely. So uh, saying, uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a way of saying, well, actually, do, magicians do lie, but it's just a way of saying, I'm not going to do that trick, because you don't want to look like a failure. So you, you do the trick anyway, but you don't. And it's just, <laughs> it's, it's a clever ruse. Yeah, oh, oh, but I no, you, I'm saying yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, you yeah, tell yeah. The, like telling the story. You don't actually do the tr do the trick. Um, very, it's very sneaky. Uh, but, but um, the, the uh, you know, like I just, I guess I'm on a roll here. Uh, you know, Richard Gage saying, you know, uh, Judy Woods. He's learning how to say the S at the end. Uh, so there's a reason why people have been conditioned to think my back, my last name has five letters. Um, but you know, Judy Woods totally denies, uh, you know, this totally denies that. And, and there's a, a page I gave you the link for it. It's um, http colon slash slash uh, um, tinyurl dot com slash nine one one liars. And on that page is uh, a, a scan of um, a scanned in uh, I think of my table of contents for chapter seven. There's also below that is a, a copy of the check Richard Gage used to purchase my book using AE Nine Eleven Truth funds. Now, in there, right in the table of contents, the sound of explosions is dealt with. 
right in there, you know, squibs, question mark, you know, and that's dealt with. These various things are dealt with right there. And he, he purchased my book in the spring of 2011. With so we, we, have, funds. we have proof, really, that Richard Gage is a liar. I mean, there's, there's no two ways to say it, and some people don't like. Which page is that? Oh, sorry, like well, that. can you just give me a URL again for that page? Uh, well, I've already posted it on Facebook, Matthew, but it's uh, tiny, tiny. It's, you know, it's the one with the contents page. I'll, I'll put it in again for. In the, in the, I'll put it in the chat window now, but it's it basically oh, will give you an image of the contents page of the book. There is also an audio clip of uh, Richard Gage uh, saying that uh, if Dr. Judy Wood is going to ignore all, all of that evidence um, then she's practicing witchcraft you know so Richard Gage is de describing the Where Did the Towers Go book as witchcraft you know and he also uh, says that you know, she's just ignoring the evidence uh, and she doesn't yeah. talk about uh, micros you know, iron rich microspheres and then the host of this particular radio show says, well, you know, what about the microspheres, iron-rich microspheres that are found in crop circles, in the soil around crop circles? And then Gage says, well, I don't know about that. So here he is ignoring the evidence that I presented in my yep. book. <laughs> yep. And he, he uh, bought this book off Matthew... What was Nows. Nows. Matthew yeah. Nows. And yeah, Matthew Nows has, you know, got quite a lot to thank him for, really, because... Um, he was kind of in a similar position to, to me. He'd got kind of uh, wrapped into the 9/11 uh, groups quite, quite a powerful way because it, he, had, he had met me. But then in the in uh, September 2006, when you know after that, when Jones and Fetz were having their divorce, he went with uh, Jones, and then was stuck in that up until spring of 2011. Yeah, and he he be then began to realise. Uh, and we, we did an interview together in 2011 with Ralph Winterow and that's on my website he began to kind of realise that he would be led, led up the garden path by Griffin, Jones and Fetzer and others, Kevin Barrett and he actually then later came out and pointed out this that he, you know, he admitted that this is what happened to him and he just never realised and somehow he read, it, he read my book or downloaded it or something and uh, he he sort of went, oh yeah, that's that's what I've been experiencing. And he came out, and then he gave us the, that copy of that check. You know, he, he makes no secret of uh, the, the fact that he, he got it. He, he had organized the the Midwest speaking tour for Richard Gage, and then in in one of the legs between two lectures, uh, Matthew Nows was driving. Richard Gage from point A to point B and there's some other people in the car and that's when Gage uh, as Matt tells the story that's when Gage saw the book and he goes oh can I buy this sure and then he opens up the book and he's saying oh look she says such as hi isn't that stupid she says such as hi isn't that stupid and Matt said at that moment he thought what on earth do we have here and the other people in the car had the same expression on their face that was an abrupt awakening at that moment yeah yeah so I think I don't know whether he'd read my book then or before then or after then but it was obviously around the same time he realised that there was something seriously wrong when he had all this scientific evidence and this guy wasn't even going to he was laughing it off you know he wasn't sitting there saying, sitting there saying oh god you know I've never seen that picture before wait a minute that means I've got to really re-examine this you know he, he wasn't having that reaction at all and Gage has continued and he's been on 30 date tours across Canada and uh the US, you know, since 2011, he's done like two or three tours then. And, uh, uh there's a chap that we know who d does a lot of sort of background digging. And, uh, he, f he found the tax, uh, records for A911, which is a 501 organization now. And 501c3. They, and they're, yeah, they're, they're that's taking, another interesting thing. That if I, being a 501c3 is not for profit, it's kind of like what churches are. Uh, and so he cannot lobby Congress. You, that's a political action committee. In, in, in not, a not-for-profit cannot lobby Congress. So it can't, right. it, no intention from the beginning of, of ever doing anything. No, How many so members they just, do they boast to have? It's, it's, oh, they, they, well, the membership thing, again, that's a bit nebulous, really, because what they claim is a member, maybe just somebody who's logged on to the website, put their username and <coughs> password in. And they and never then, come back to the website. 
never come back to the website necessarily or just put Phil <laughs> in a profile, you know, with some general information about their background and they don't even have to be an architect or an engineer. I mean, I, I knew somebody who'd put themselves on there and they worked at Argos as a, you know, in the warehouse. <laughs> you mm. know, they weren't, they weren't actually an architect or an engineer. I mean, they might have had some architecture, architectural or engineering knowledge, but they certainly weren't a professional, uh, you know, Ar architect or engineer. But what, what figure is it they throw out there? It was 2200 that was what was thrown out last time. I, I, you know that architects do not build buildings. They, they mm. design the, uh, the, the concept of the building. You know, like Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright or whatever, even the, the, uh, was it Yamaguchi or Yamamoto or something like that, that, that uh, Yamamoto, I think, um, that designed the towers to be like trees blowing in the wind, you know, that kind of structure. But they don't design, um, how much steel goes here, how many bolts go there, you know, the strength of the building. They don't go through engineering school. They just, you know, how do you feel in this space? How's this space used? What message is this building? That's an architecture thing. It's a form of artwork. Um, and engineers, you know, building engineers are who design the building. How much steel do you put in the concrete for rebars? You know, and how much, uh, you know, what kind of bolts do you need to bolt the building together? Architects have no clue. That isn't what they do. So what, does it matter if they're architects? Uh, and actually, there's this, um, you know, Abe Rodriguez, who's now Dr. Rodriguez, he was a medical student at the time, he went to uh, uh, one of Richard Gage's talks because Gage, when he he said, oh, Mr. Gage, have you seen this evidence on, on Dr. Judy Wood's site? And they, they X'd him off the list and didn't tell him. And so he wanted to confront Gage about it, and he went to to uh, one of those speaking tour things. And um, afterwards, he, he went up to him and... and and confront him about the um, seismic data. And Richard Gates says, well, I don't know anything about the seismic uh, data. I, I, I'm not a, a seismologist, and I, I, you know, I don't know anything about it. But wait, he's an architect in San Francisco, waiting for the big one, right? Um, and and uh, he doesn't um, do anything about seismographs. Interesting. It is interesting. But, uh, we're probably going to have to wrap this up very soon. Yeah. We've, we've probably gone twice as long as we should have done. But before we do, I was really wondering to go through the um, Greg Jenkins um, facade, shall we say? Oh, well, uh, I'm, I'm kind of getting low on energy, but um, yeah, uh, just oh, but, but I'll just I'll just I'll just drop one hint in it. You know, people are trained to to think because uh, the, this poor lighting and. You, you remember as kids, you'd hold the flashlight under your chin at sleepovers, you know, so you can play, tell ghost stories, look scary. Well, that's essentially what they did with me. And he was basically asking me, uh, have you stopped beating your spouse yet? You know, it's a lose, lose, lose answer. Either you're being evasive, which makes you look guilty, or saying yes means you used to beat your spouse. Saying no means you're still beating your spouse. So it, it's this um, game playing thing. He wasn't interested in the facts. And, but, the thing I'm very, I was very tired at the time, but I'm very proud of myself on. I caught him every time he was, uh, trying to turn dustification into vaporization or, uh, something else. But what he was, what I learned from it was that he, um, uh, told me exactly what the most important things to cover up was. That the dust went up, that the building mostly turned to dust, and there wasn't a lot of rubble left over, and the dust was very, very fine. Yeah, don't look up, don't look up. None of the absolutely no dust went up. Is, that was his position, and it was very coarse. It was 1.3 millimeters in diameter. No, this dust got so fine it was on the order of the size of DNA, one one hundredth of the size of red blood cells. Now, as you inhale, it goes right into your bloodstream. That would make anybody sick. Uh, and you know, he didn't want that to come out. So it was all these things he was, he was trying to hide. But let's think about it. I was made to look like a fool for saying that most of the building turned to dust. Look how many years it's been since then that that has remained covered up because of that ridicule, because people bought into the ridicule. I'd like to say, um, how did how did you end up being there? Uh, uh, Jim Fetzer said he was going to be presenting my work there, 
What's he doing presenting my work? See, I was innocent and naive back then. And, and he wanted me in the audience. See, I'm in South Carolina, and that's in Washington, D.C. That's like a, you know, at least a 10-hour drive. And I, I have, uh, you know, kitties that I have to get put someplace. And, you know, I was going to stay at my parents' place and put them there. You know, so there's a lot of stuff to do. Okay. Uh, but he really needed me to be there. And because to answer questions, is the case is questions. Well, okay, I got there just in the nick of time. I, I'd drive through the night and whatnot. Um, and then, uh. Yeah, I, we didn't get there though. Right, yeah, I, I had a problem with my, my debit card. Uh, Walmart, you know, screwed up my typing the number in, so they canceled my card. So I didn't have any money, and Fetzer was going to wire me the money. I should have accepted, but then that, you know, what's, what's she doing getting money from Fetzer? Um, because he desperately needed me to be there. And, and coming up, I was, thought I was going to get there late, and he said, well, as long as you're there for the end of it. Well, I got there for the beginning of it, and I was sitting through it, and when he said some bogus stuff, I called him on it. I thought, that's what I was there for. Like when he was doing the Normanetta, 50 miles out, 30 miles out, 20, you know, I said, how fast can that uh, young officer run? You know, uh, it, it, plane going 600 miles an hour, that's uh, 10 miles a minute. You know, between 50 and 30, that's two minutes. Is he running to and from the radar room and carrying on a conversation with Cheney in that amount of time? You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, how'd the plane get there by bicycle? Um, and then he was so, shut up, shut up, shut up. And uh, I was confused. And then at the end of the thing, uh, this guy has a pad of paper and a pencil. He's kind of my, yes, you know, a few questions. I said, well, I gotta go to the bathroom. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you could ask him, you know, I, I gotta go to the bathroom. So I, I kept being insistent. I was on my way to the bathroom. Well, I came out and uh, walked in this room. The lights are on. The camera's rolling. Am I going to get caught saying, oh, see how evasive she is? You know, I'm stuck. That's how I felt. But he wanted me to sit down and ask these questions. Oh, okay. And I sit down to answer the questions. Uh, well, I, before I sat down, I said, well, I want that seat instead because I wanted the people in front of me instead of behind me. And, uh, you know, so uh, they said, well, now we have to change all the lighting. I was too tired to say, why do you have to change the lighting? Notice they have a profile shot of me. My skin is purple. It's up close. I'm out of focus. And Jenkins, you know, pretty boy, nice straight on shot and, you know, in focus and good skin color. Yeah. But that makes a big effect on people. And uh, then... Um, uh, so afterwards, you know, somebody actually recorded the thing, gave me a recording of it. It, 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 there's no information that came out of it. Nothing I said wrong. You know, he was trying like the Dickens to get me to, to, uh, uh, speculate. And I, no, I'm not going to speculate. You know, what kind of energy? Well, we haven't gotten there yet. You know, some, some type and of. And he switched energy. the picture. Right. Well, yeah, I also switched the picture that if you, um, if I show you in a, in a, in a, in a talking with you about this picture of a cow, and then I post it online with a picture of a horse. I said, isn't that guy an idiot? He doesn't even see that that's a horse. It was the equivalent of that, that, you know, the picture's inserted at the beginning, at the end. And it wasn't exactly a lie. It was a misleading truth, which is a lie. He said that this was after at the National Press Club after she gave a talk. I had given a talk there four months earlier. This was about Fetzer. He wasn't asking Fetzer any questions. And uh, by the end, I, I was kind of having fun with him. About two-thirds of the way through, <laughs> Jenkins was saying, well, all the, the rubble was there, and the building turned dust. I said, oh, wh- show it to me, you know, in this picture you, you gave me. Um, and he said, well, it's there. You don't see it. I said, no. And we kept going round, 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 round. And finally, he had to fold his cards. And I was kind of mopping the floor with him. He was, you know, turned into a sweat and rubbing his head and at that moment Jim Fetzer came burst into the room rolls up his sleeve like he's going to punch out Greg Jenkins and save the damsel in distress only the, only the damsel wasn't in distress it was Greg Jenkins who was in distress it didn't go according to script the Fetzer had, had disappeared until about two thirds way, way through and he was going to look like you know he came in to save the damsel in distress and I was you know saying well, Jenkins where's the you know where's the building you know it used to be up here in, in, in two thirds or at least half is gone. Where to go? Is it on the ground yet? Where to go? I don't know. I don't know. He was really getting into a panic and getting into a sweat. And shortly after that, security guard came in and said that you guys are here illegally. You have to leave. So Jenkins didn't even have permission to be in that room. It was a room with connect to a room, connect to a room. And the next day, I, uh, I called Fetzer and I said, uh, "Why did you invite me up here?" And he cursed me out and slammed the phone down. 
Uh, yeah, uh, and it's somebody else, uh, you know, point out later in Jenkins' uh, thesis for his, his PhD, you know, in the acknowledgments, he's, he's thanking NSA for sponsoring, uh, you know, at least some of his uh, PhD work. NSA, you know that NSA? And he has a security clearance too. He also has a security clearance. So it was, but it was clear to me, you know, my dust series, that was motivated by, by Jenkins. Uh, but then right after that, Stephen Jones emailed Greg Jenkins and, uh, invited him to submit a, uh, a hit piece on me for his, his, you know, Journal of 9 studies. And then hinted at him how to make it worse, how to insert this picture that it could be mistook this way and, and make it seem like that's what, what Dr. Wood is talking about. You know, that, that is, as though this is the picture she's looking at. It's a totally different picture. And, uh, then Jenkins was so proud of himself, he, he, uh, spammed it out to all the people in DC 9-11 Truth Movement, in the Truth Organization. And one of those people, um, forwarded it to me, forwarded it to Fetzer. Fetzer immediately forwarded it to Jones without taking the guy's name off of it, so they would know who the leak was. And then uh, uh, Jones then sent out an email saying, "I retract, I retract that letter. <laughs> Why? He's already out there. Uh, that that email is on my website. Um, and uh, it's, but it, it's what's interesting about it is to see how subtle it is to drop the hit without explicitly stating it. Kind of, you know, when when Stephen Jones directs you to that hit piece on the eighty nine eleven truth site, well, when people ask me that question, I just direct them to this." You know, I, I give him that link. Oh, absolutely. It, but he makes it seem like, well, that's what I do. You can do what you want to do, and you know, like hint, hint. That's probably what you want to do. He doesn't tell them. He he lets them own it. So, so, so sorry, you're, sorry you're, to get into that, but it's it's part of the you know. I also I'll, I'll want, want to get into it. Too. I, I, want I also want to you know you know you guys started out with thermite. I didn't have that problem to overcome I had this other like you really want to think the best of somebody and well maybe Stephen Jones is having a senior moment he just he just doesn't realize that you know high school physics he forgot that you know aluminum glows at the same time as your iron glows and so I wrote him this email saying you know Stephen are you having a senior moment I actually said that and I sent him pictures you know I didn't know how to find pictures on the internet at that point but I I knew what the material was because it was in my lab it was 99.97 percent aluminum and I had it glowing, and I sent him the pictures. And my student had helped me take those pictures. And Stephen Jones' response was, uh, well, maybe it glows in, in Clemson, South Carolina, but it doesn't glow in Provo, Utah. You no. Know, what can I do with that? I, I'm at the end of the road. Like, can, can a PhD educated nuclear physicist be this slow to figure it out? And I came, I came to using that question. If you naturally find yourself asking that, you know what the answer is. You know, you want to give somebody a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. And if you give them 200 second chances and you still give them another second chance, they're good. This is no accident that this group is... Um, that was Jim Fetzer, by the way. That I gave him 200 second chances and I still was going to give him another second chance. You, you, know, you know there's something wrong with them, but you're still going to get... Because, you know... Our humanity is used against us. We want Absolutely. to see the best in people. We want to give them every benefit of every doubt. Yeah, some people just don't deserve it. These people don't, they don't realize the world that they are stopping coming forward by suppressing knowledge that we could we could do something about. If if the nine one one truth movement rallied behind you, would the any could we go forward? Could we? Oh yeah, but th- that's that's a different. You know, one thing it's it's getting later so that it's it's too much junk out there. Well, yeah. they could, some say it's thermite. Some say it's nukes. Some say it's mini nukes. Some say it's well, radiation outer space. Are, so are, I guess, are, I guess we'll never know what really happened. Let's move on. Yeah. Nothing to see here. The nine one seven are now not denying the justification of the, the, the that's that warming. Right. And that's taken them uh, seven and a half years of ridiculing yeah, me big, uh, for saying it. Yeah, well, and and it's and. and I like to say this for the people listening out there that if you see somebody posting that Greg Jenkins video, it now is to my benefit because it shows I was right all along and I was being ridiculed for saying the building turned to dust. Most of the building turned to dust, and Jenkins was saying all the rubble's the, it piles there. It's this huge rubble pile. None, none of none of it turned to dust, or you know, he was covering that up. 
I was ridiculed Absolutely. for saying that most of the building turned to dust. Well, apparently the truth goes through three, three phases. Ridicule, um, what is it? Ridicule, uh, mocking, or something, and then acceptance. No, then self-evident, isn't it? Ridicule, acceptance, then self-evidence, or something like that. The um the 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 phases yeah. of the truth. Well, for, for as I think Gandhi said it. Uh, first, first they ignore you, then they fight you, um, uh, th- then you win. But it, the other stage that somebody else uh, uh, refers to is then it's self evident. It's like yeah, everybody it. knows that, or 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 little Judy's talking about ray beams from outer space, and that's stupid. But see, we're right. We discovered it turned to dust. That is starting to kick in yeah. because they don't realize that I've been saying this all along. That's you can go to, to uh, uh, the government website, NIST, where I, it, they have posted my um, request for corrections from 2007. It's been up there all this time. You can go, go there and see. That's what, I was, that's what they needed to control. They yes, wanted, uh, if you don't like the lie behind yeah, door number one, we show you the lie behind door number two. If you don't like that, we show you the lie behind door number three. You know, nukes, mini nukes, micro nukes, thermite, thermite, super thermite, anything to keep you from turning around looking at the evidence that, that Dr. Wood is showing you. And yeah. and the, once, you, the, once you've seen it, you've you seen it. Up. There's no no going back. You know, once you know the truth, there's no going. Oh, I'm just going to forget the truth. No, you know it. That's it. You know, there's no going back. And the, the title of my book is another thing that Fed says. Oh, that's your theory. No, I show evidence. I show evidence of what happened on 9/11. What happened on 9/11? The, most of the building turned to dust in midair. That right there is proof that there exists a technology that can turn most of a building to dust in midair. Yeah, the evidence yeah. of what happened is proof that a technology that can do what was done exists. Now you don't need to see the Satan. You know it exists. Uh, yeah, you know it exists because you can. You, you know, I've I've very well documented what it does, and I don't want people to use the name because they use these trendy terms, harp, Bin Laden, whatever. It, those are just names to to focus on. Focus on the evidence, what it can do. Now, now it, there's evidence of the technology existing. But think of what else we could do with that technology instead. Instead of using it to blow up the world, let's use it to provide free energy to the whole world. So what the evidence of what happened on 9-11 is evidence that free energy technology exists. If people get out of their mindset, you know, the brainwashing, and look at the picture on the cover of my book, the bubbler picture, they look, once they realize what the evidence is showing them, you know, and, and not... You know, may, you know, say, oh, collapse, collapse. You know, if they realize this building is turning dust in midair, oh my gosh, everybody on the planet can know that free energy technology exists. Absolutely, and that's what we've got to strive for. That. Have you got? Any, have you got any closing words? Because we're going to wrap it yeah. right, right uh, up. Yeah, now. Th- think your own thoughts. Know what it is that you know that you know that you know, and know that everything else you don't know, and don't don't fill in the gap with speculation and guesswork. And what because then you don't know what you have anymore. Okay. Speculation can, can can give you encouragement where to go look, but you have to have evidence to know what it is that you know that you know that you know. Yeah, I believe this world owes you a great, great, great thanks, but it needs it, it needs an apology as well for its way it's treated you. It's absolutely horrendous. Uh, any closing words, Andrew? Yeah, yeah well, I think uh, you've just got to um, make sure that you do do due diligence with this stuff and uh, I encourage people for example to check us out you know write to us um, and uh, check check into our backgrounds read, read, yeah read read the book and then uh, say yeah. yeah read 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 my book which is free does it stand up to your scrutiny have I said anything that's untrue you know, have, have we said anything that's untrue tonight? Check it out. And, and uh, you know, you ha- you have to verify this. It's too important to take anybody else's word for it because it's uh, it's just too important. And uh, all the personal attacks and all that sort of thing, they're kind of secondary to the building and developing your own understanding of what's what's actually happened and how it's been covered up. And once you've done that, you'll be in a much better state for tackling this horrendous uh, sort of... Uh, I don't know what to call it, this horrendous new understanding that you have of, of, of what's happened in the world. So, uh, you know, you have to learn to live with that. And there you have it. Um, thanks for listening. You've been listening to Red Pill, Raw Truth. Um, see you next week. Thanks.
Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Woods. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew and Matthew. Second Hi. show, four hours. Dr. <laughs> Judy Woods. Break. I forgot to go to break, mate. I'm sorry. <laughs> Swish. Swish. No net. Are we still on? I don't yes, know. Yes, we are. We're going to lead out with this, so mute okay. up your mics. Oh, wow. Here we go. First Dr. Judy Woods. First the host.